Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 25th meeting of 2018. <coughs> we have no apologies. Can I invite John Finney to declare an interest? Um, thank you, Convener. Um, as ever, we have a considerable uh, amount of, of information before us today. W one of the pieces of information we have relates to a historic case, and I have two interests to declare. Not one is that I was involved in part as a Scottish Police Federation official, and at one point. Um, as uh, an MSP for the area. I have no active involvement in that case now. OK, thank you. Duly noted. Agenda item um, one is post-legislative scrutiny of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012. And this morning we'll be foc focusing on police complaints handling process. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I welcome Chief Superintendent Mark Hargraves, Head of Professional Standards, Police Scotland, and Lindsay McNeill, Director of Governance and Assurance, Scottish Police Authority. Um, can I thank the SP for their, their written submission, which of course is always very helpful for the committee. We're going to move straight to questions. And can I start by asking in you to, to perhaps outline in the very broadest and briefest terms how um, Police Scotland's complaints handling process and the role of the Professional Standards Department um, works and where SPE fits into the process. So just to, to get us started, an overview. Who'd like to, to start with that? Take that one first. Thank you. Convener. OK, so the, the role of Police Scotland in the complaints handling process refers to complaints received by officers below or of the rank or below the rank of chief superintendent, so from constable to chief superintendent. Anything above that rank would be undertaken by the Scottish Police Authority. Um, my role as a head of professional standards, um, I report into the executive uh, ACC for professionalism and assurance, who in turn reports into the deputy chief constable for professionalism. Um, and I have responsibility for the efficient and effective handling of complaints uh, received for, for Police Scotland. OK. And that's dealt with by you, and if it's below a certain level, then it's done internally, is, is that the...? That, that, that's correct. Um, complaints will be um, managed by either local policing divisions or, under certain circumstances, will be managed by professional standards department themselves, which is a, a smaller, obviously, unit we will deal with, primarily com criminal complaints or, or more complex complaints. And can I ask you then, before I go to uh, where SPA fits into the process, um, is it different if the issue is a public complaint or a conduct issue, in, in other words, uh, an internal police complaint? Is the process any different? So if, if it's a complaint about the police by a member of the public, then it would be recorded as such. If it's an internal complaint, we would have to ascertain the nature of that complaint, whether it's, it's grievance related and we have a separate process for that or if it's identified as a conduct matter, again, as a separate process for, for that as well. Complaints, conduct and grievance are three distinct and separate processes. Could you explain how that would work in an example of each? Yes, of course. Um, so, for example, if um, a member of the public wanted to complain about the actions of a police officer, um, that would it invariably be recorded as a complaint about the police. Um, there are numerous options uh, for how that's investigated under our six-stage process. Um, we would have the initial notification of that complaint. We would then record and initially assess that. Um, we have, uh, prior to the full investigation of a complaint, um, the opportunity to uh, resolve this through what we would determine a front-line resolution, which is only used in certain circumstances. So, for example, if the complaint was certainly non-criminal, non-complex, and what we determine non-serious. Um, so if it was a matter of, say, incivility, that might be appropriate for local resolution. Um, and that would take place by our, primarily by our Complaints Assessment and Resolution Unit within Professional Standards, who deal approximately with 40% of the total of complaints that come in throughout the year. And those uh, are resolved at a local level, which is, is actually to the satisfaction of the member of the public and impacts less on them and the officers and any witnesses concerned. We found it to be um, an efficient and effective means of resolving what you might term perhaps the less series of complaints. 
Uh, and can you talk me through, you know, an example of that and how it would work? Sure. Um, so what would happen was uh, normally um, complaints are recorded online. We would assess that complaint, and if it was deemed suitable for frontline resolution, uh, a member of my team would contact that member of the public and attempt to address and resolve that issue, understand what the complaint is, and uh, whether there is an explanation or an apology required, then that would be offered um, in that attempt. If the member of the public um, that would be confirmed in a letter, and if the member of the public is satisfied at that point in time, then that the matter would be concluded at that point. Mm -hmm. If they are not satisfied, as per the letter, it, it informs them exactly what they need to do. They would uh, then state that they are not satisfied. We would then instigate what we would call the full uh, six-stage process, which would allow us approximately 50, but not approximately exactly 56 days within which to conclude. We will maybe touch on the time scales later. Sure. I just wanted to know. And the other categories you, you've done, if it's um, yep. serious but non criminal? Yep. So if it's serious but non criminal, then it would, uh, would not be suitable for frontline resolution. That would automatically go into that um, standard complaint process, if you like, um, whereby we would allocate that to either the local policing division um, or, in the case of criminal or specialist investigation, if that was felt necessary, we would allocate it either within professional standards department or to one of our local, regional or national specialist departments, depending on the type of complaint that was being made. Um, Following the investigation of that, we would reach a determination and then identify any organisational or individual learning and then provide that notification to the complainer, ideally within the, the prescribed time scales. If it was a, prescribed, a criminal matter, it would come to ourselves and professional standards to uh, report to the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service for their determination on that matter. So, is there a possibility within the serious and um, non-criminal when it's referred to local, a local policing division, that division is actually investigating itself. Well, we would always make sure that the, for example, it's not it's taken outside of the, the line management structure, so there is a degree of impartiality. Um, notwithstanding that, um, the, the investigation um, is explained in the final letter to the complainer, so that they can understand exactly what steps have been taken to address that complaint. If they remain dissatisfied with uh, the investigation or the outcome, they have the right, and that is provided for in the final letter to the complainant, that they can revert the matter to the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner if they remain dissatisfied. Uh, we found that um, only 5 per cent of complainants choose to take up this method. Mm -hmm. Now, given that 46 per cent of the, claim, the complaints that are made are the internal police complaints. And given the old system where you had eight leg of, legacy forces um, that allowed a neighbouring um, force quite independently to look into the complaint of another force, then can I ask you to respond to something that we received in a submission from Karen Harper, which concerns, um, uh, which highlights concerns raised about complaints being dealt with impartially and transparently that um, she considered sometimes there was a, con a conflict of interest when investigating these internal complaints. I, I, I have read the submission that you refer to, convener, and um, that um, in any case, when we identify complaints, we always try and identify the most suitable uh, method of allocation to ensure that independence and impartiality. Um, to take that one step further, whether it is, for example, a complaint about a member of the Professional Standards Department, which also incorporates the anti-corruption unit, then that matter would be investigated outside of the department. Um, so that, that, that used to be investigated within Professional Standards. However, that no longer happens. And the SP are also notified when we receive such a complaint. Okay. Can I ask the SBC where they are in this process? In the process, the complaints oh, process? Okay. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so, SPA handles complaints against the senior officers of the Assistant Chief Constable um, rank and above about complaints about SPA itself and about SPA members of staff. So, we, we follow a very similar process as to the, how Mark Hargreaves has just described. In relation to our oversight of Police Scotland complaints handling, we have a, a regular performance report coming before the recently established Complaints and Conduct Committee, which actually um, Police Scotland professionals actually come along to talk through the performance statistics uh, and allows for a deep dive questioning by committee members themselves. We can also go into private session to discuss further details. Um, we also uh, have oversight of the complaint handling reviews that obviously go to PERC uh, and we see the results that come back from that and it also allows us to have a further questioning of Police Scotland where that is appropriate. 
Um, SP itself also conducts a dip sampling exercise across Police Scotland, um, across the National Complaints Handling Service, and that's using a, a, a using the system, a desk-based exercise, and it looks at the analysis of the closed complaints and their compliance against stated policies and procedures. Okay. Did I read that um, there was a, a complaints conduct committee, and this has been re-established? Indeed, convener. The the new chair, since she came in in December, one of her first acts was to actually establish, re-establish the Complaints and Conduct Committee made up of some of the SPA board members. So that now meets on a, a monthly basis, basis at least, but it's actually met since uh, 12 times since January of this year. And they have a role and remit in determining actual complaint cases that come to SPA. They are considered in a private session. Can I ask why it was dis disbanded originally? Um, I, th I think the... It was part of their, uh, the previous chair's governance review. Uh, they, it was just decided that the, that particular committee was disbanded and the decision making in all complaint cases was delegated to the then chief executive. And you don't know why that decision was taken? It was a decision for the previous chair. And did any of the board members question that? I couldn't comment on that. I wasn't there at the time. Could you perhaps write to the committee and get that further information going back? Because I think understanding why things went wrong in the past helps us to understand if it's been resolved now. It certainly, can be. we'll do that after. Thank you. Lee McCarthy. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, you'll be aware that the uh, Chief Inspector of Constabulary and Auditor General um, uh, identified um, the need for improvements in the in the complaint handling process. He didn't go into great detail in terms of the, the concerns, but I think... Uh, some of them will be uh, those touched on by the convener and, and, and others will, will go on to, uh, to consider uh, through questioning of other colleagues. I mean, from your own perspective, do you see improvements, <coughs> areas where improvements can be, uh, need to be made? Uh, and if so, are those improvements that would require us to, to, to go back, look at the, uh, the original act and make legislative change to enable those to happen? I, I can answer that first, um, Mr MacArthur. Um, I think that, uh, by and large, I think the process, the current process uh, for complaint handling within Police Scotland, of course, while there is always room for improvement, and in that regard, we would welcome um, the review by Dame Eilish and uh, into complaint handling, and we'll certainly work with, with uh, that, that team to obviously try and improve anything in areas where we can. Um, I, I think that we, the fact that we have um, a process at the moment whereby you know 95% of people who engage in our complaint handling process choose uh, not to to pursue the matter any further once we have a, a, a addressed their complaint. Uh, this, you know, notwithstanding that they certainly have that right to, um, gives me some confidence that the process that we have in place uh, is is suitable. However, accepting that there's always room for improvement. And and when I mean, you mentioned Dame Eilish's uh, review, and, and and obviously that will obviously take forward um, uh, any considerations that a range of stakeholders may have. In terms of your engagement or Police Scotland's engagement with that process, are, are there uh, recommendations that, that you are making to, to Dame Eilish um, in, in terms of the way in which the process might be improved, notwithstanding what you've said? I think it probably would be a bit premature to comment on that, uh, Mr MacArthur. Um, I certainly, but well, I can assure you that we will fully engage and cooperate with the review by Dame Eilish and Giolini. OK. Ms McNeil. Uh, in relation from SPA's point of view, certainly our, we... It was part of our original submission to this committee, which is the, the chair is quite um, public on record saying that we don't think that opening up the, this act is, is, is beneficial in the long term. However, the underpinning legislation, i.e. the regulations for performance and conduct specifically, um, we, would, per, would perhaps uh, be, could be looked at again. Um, again, m a matter of the public record, very much keen to uh, look at system-wide changes in relation to complaints handling generally. Um, and obviously, we welcome the Dame Eilish uh, review as well, and we're actively engaged with her and our secretariat. But obviously, I mean, the SPA, as you've already alluded to, has, has been on a bit of a, a journey in recent times, and that, that it had the complaints committee. Um, that was then uh, abandoned and a different process put in place, and now that's been re-established uh, as well. I mean, clearly, um, you've, you've taken a view that things in the past have not 
um, work. So, so what are you saying today, Matt Ailish, in terms of things that you would like to, or the SPA would like to see uh, going forward to improve the system? So there are certainly some improvements that we've already identified, um, as, I've, as I've made mention, as in terms of changes to the regulations and secondary legislation. There are also improvements that we are currently doing and have and are looking towards in terms of improvements ourselves. So things such as changing the complaint handling procedures, making them more streamlined, making sure that there's a, a director level triage of, of complaints coming in, looking at categories of complaints, taking on board the perks feedback. Um, uh, and you know that collectively we're working towards that. We have our new complaint handling procedures out to consultation with stakeholders currently, uh, and, and we'll be taking that, that lessons learned. Our complaints committee have also commissioned us to look back over the past five and a half years, particularly in relation to statistics, our, our lessons learned, our trend analysis, uh, and that will actually be reported to our next um, complaints and conduct committee in October. So all of that information together is going to be um, analysed and fed back to the Ailish's secretariat so that we can uh, identify both things that we can do at our own hand as well as what can feed into her review. And in, and in terms of the concerns raised by the Scottish Chief Police uh, Officers Staff Association in relation to changes th they feel are needed to the, the, the 2013 regulation, is the SPA or indeed Police Scotland taken, taken a view on that? I know there are specific concerns about the way in which um, each stage of the process is, is marked with the release of, of uh, notification to the to the press and the con some concerns around um, whether or not that um, is, is prejudicial to the, the reputation of individuals in, involved. I, I would say that we are, are very keen and very robust to ensure the confidentiality of the process, both for those who make complaints and those who are complained about. Um, all of these matters, especially when it refers to misconduct particularly, are very sensitive employment matters. And, and we take our, our welfare of our officers you know, seriously, as well as taking on board that people do make genuine complaints. And it's about having that time, fairness, proportionality to ensure that we can actually conduct those initial inquiries effectively so that we can bottom out these complaints. And in terms of the, the, the practice of, of publishing a news release um, on the website at each stage of a, a complaint into a senior police officer, can you maybe, I, I can understand there's, that there's a need to be transparent given some of the concerns that have been raised around the SPA, but obviously there'll be a sensitivity around the information that, that can be released at, at any stage in relation to a, 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 an investigation that may have some way still to go. So what, what, how is that balance struck in terms of, of, of what's issued? And indeed, um, is there any sympathy for the, the concerns raised by the association that there there's effectively should be no information released until the conclusion of the investigation? I, I think it was captured in, in our previous submission that confidentiality is, is an absolute requirement for this process. I think there have been circumstances where things have not necessarily um, played out that way. However, certainly uh, when we make ref references and referrals, we only ever refer to a senior officer unless circumstances dictate otherwise. Right. And, and you alluded to information that has, uh, had, had been made public out with that process. How has that come about? Is that leaks within the SPA, within Police Scotland, conjecture on the part of the media? I wouldn't like to say something that I can't prove otherwise. However, certainly internally we have conducted um, security leak investigations and nothing has been derived from SPA. Mm. I couldn't comment on anything else. Mm. Is, Hargrave, is there anything that you would wish to say in relation to, to those concerns from the association in particular? I, I think, Mr MacArthur, the matter of uh, complaints about executive offices is a matter for the <coughs> SPA. I don't think it would be appropriate for Police Scotland to comment. Uh, we deal with complaints up to and including the rank of Chief Superintendent. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just on, on that point, um, is the SPA revising this um, procedure where they issued a, a, a release? They refer to a senior officer and it's blatantly obvious to everyone exactly who that person is? I think it reflects the small number of chief officers that we actually have. And certainly when we, ref when we make those conduct referrals um, to PERC, uh, we are indeed revising those processes. We're taking on board all lessons learned from the past. So is that yes? That's a yes. Yes. And you mentioned it reflects, what was it, the smallness, did you say? The 
this has come about? What exactly did you see in your answer there? Sorry, with regard to the small number of senior officers. Is this because we're talking about a single police force? Whereas, again, with legacy forces, there were um, a number of senior officers in various positions. I think that's probably a, 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 an area which it doesn't necessarily reflect that it's a, a single police force. I think it just reflects a matter of fact that we have a small number of senior officers and that's the number that SPA are responsible for. Because that's how the legislation is constructed and that's what the legislation says. Yes. OK, thank you. Who's next? Rona. Thank you, yeah. convener. Good morning. Um, Ms McNeill, in an earlier answer, you um, referred to the approach of dip sampling by um, the SPA. I, I'm struggling to understand exactly what that is. Would you care to tell us what that is exactly? Of course, Ms Mackay. Um, dip sampling is a process whereby the SPA complaints team of, of three members of staff will look at, uh, uh, on a quarterly basis, the number of complaints that have been completed and closed by Police Scotland and they, they can do a, a verification on the system against a sample size. So they, they go in and check the, the types of complaints received, the, the substance of the, the complaints. Uh, they look at how the process was closed off and the final decision letters that are issued to complainers to make sure that they actually comply with policies and procedures. And has there been any sort of evaluation of that done into, into its effectiveness? The, the committee um, had this discussion with the, the complaints team at the last Complaints and Conduct Committee, uh, and again, there are probably lessons to be learned there about how we can best conduct that going forward, and that's part of our ongoing uh, internal improvement. Are you able to say what lessons were learned at this stage? To be honest, I think it's a, in terms of our presentation and our recording and, our, uh, and how we present that analysis, so we're, we're taking lessons on board with that. But the actual practice itself, you feel, is robust enough? Um, it, it has been to date, yes. Okay, how long has, has that been, the, the process? That process has been going on for four years. Four years, okay. Thank you. Daniel. Um, I, I'd just like to begin by just looking at the numbers. Uh, if you look at them in, in terms of the, the submission from the SPA, it, it's you're dealing with hundreds of cases of complaint per year um, and, and tens of... of uh, 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 cases within the SPA remit. Can you just clarify how many officers at ACC and above are we actually talking about? Because it seems like a very high number for what is a relatively small number of people. Is that a fair reflection? Uh, just to put some of those numbers in context, uh, remember the SPA accepts complaints against the SPA itself, SPA members of staff, as well as senior officers, so those numbers reflect all of those cases. They also refer to um, historical cases that were brought forward from legacy joint police boards, mm -hmm. and actually, um, in putting some context around those numbers, um, we're actually used as an escalation route when people are dissatisfied with Police Scotland. So it's not necessarily about senior officers. I, I, I was just wondering whether what, how that reflects, the, therefore, and indeed the fact that um, uh, one in five cases raised with the SPA are actually within the SPA remit, how that reflects on, on, on both the, kind of the, the, the transparency, clarity and robustness of the, the complaints process overall, if people feel like they have to go to the SPA to complain. I think, w without going into individual complaint cases, I, I think that since the inception of SPA, that uh, we have been used as a, a, as a place for people to land various complaints with, without ne them necessarily understanding what our full legislative capability and remit actually is. So there's been a misunderstanding. So going forward, again, one of our improvements would be helping people understand what we can accept complaints about and what, we're, what we can't. I'd just like to put a similar point to Mr Hargreaves. I mean, I have to say, one of the things, just reflecting on what you were saying, is that you've got three different ways that complaints can be handled with a, a number of different then procedures within that. It, it does strike me that, that that's quite a complex system. Is there an issue in terms of both the robustness and transparency of this process, just in terms of its complexity in and of itself. Is that, is that an issue in terms of the complaints process? Uh, 
Well, what, what I would say is um, that the manner by which people raise issues to us, r regardless of what they may be categorised, I think is, is reasonably straightforward. It's, it's, I think it's well explained on our, our website. Most of our complaints do uh, come through the online system um, and they're recorded and assessed as such. Um, they inevitably are, are complaints um, and the determination within that as, as to whether or not they are suitable for, as I said earlier, frontline resolution or a more full and thorough investigation depending on the needs and wants of the complainant. Um, if the matter is grievance, uh, it's an internal matter. You know, it would be you know, an officer's issue raised uh, regards another officer or member of staff, um, and that's dealt with uh, internally rather than the online complaints process. And if a matter is identified as conduct, that, that can come about as a consequence of a complaint process, or it can uh, be identified um, internally as a matter that we would deal with, again, separately. But in terms of complaints that members of the public may wish to raise, there's a single route, and that uh, is, is the online complaints process. Or, of course, they can write or telephone to complain as per the guidance on the website. Um, what I would say is that the, there are well-established processes in place should the, the complainant be dissatisfied with the original complaint handling method. And if it's criminal, they can go to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, or if it's non-criminal, they have that right of recourse to the PERC. I was just wondering if you could perhaps um, share with the committee the, the sort of documentation around the distinction between the grievance process and the professional conduct process, because I don't want to bottom it out today, but I, I certainly would welcome that, that clarification. But just moving on, and, and on the robustness point, I mean, clearly it's hugely important that the subject of a complaint is, is, is then uh, uh, dealt with very carefully sure. and that, that details of that com complaint are, are not shared with the, the individual in, until it's appropriate to do so, i.e. You know, the, 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 the nature and substance of that. Are you confident that, that those structures are in place to, to ensure that, that the subjects don't receive inappropriate um, detail? Do you mean the, the officers who are, who are subject yes. to a complaint? So the, the process that we have in place um, means that uh, we, in, in the last couple of years, this process has been subject to significant review. We have a process in place where we agree what we would call a heads of complaint, which is essentially a, a written agreement between the police and the complainant as to what exactly constitutes the complaints that are being made about the police. Once that process is agreed, it is at that point we can then essentially undertake the complaint investigation and we would then offer the, the subject officer a chance to comment on, on the allegations that have been made. Um, I'd also just like to ask you about whistleblowing. Um, sure. I, I mean, obviously, that, that is another form of complaint, but it didn't really feature in your description there of the complaints process. And I note that the Chief Constable has made a specific point around this. Could you maybe outline how whistleblowing fits within this and again give the assurance that if someone approached a senior officer uh, as, a, as a whistleblower, that those details then wouldn't be uh, shared with the, the junior rank, uh, the ranks below that point, or indeed the, the subject um, that may be contained either directly or indirectly uh, as a matter of the, 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 the matters raised in that whistleblowing case? Of course, um, as part of the restructure of the Professional Standards Department um, two years ago, um, one of the, the facilities that was introduced was a National Gateway Assessment Unit, and uh, people and officers or, or staff can uh, report matters either in name or confidentially and anonymously through what we would call integrity matters. Again, that's an online submission through which they are perfectly entitled to give their details or, or not, as the case may be, and raise any issues or allegations. Um, of course, to, to have whistleblower status, um, we would have to assess that and determine um, you know, what, what the allegation is and whether or not that individual should be afforded you know, the protection uh, of, of a whistleblower. It's not always um, a straightforward matter, but we would look at each individual circumstance. But there would be that protection and that means to report things either confidentially and or anonymously through the Integrity Matters portal or through the, um, the whistleblowing form, which can be reported again to the exact same place, uh, namely our National Gateway Assessment Unit, which takes it away from the, the local um, area where they may, may be raising the issue. I mean, I guess one of my concerns within all of this, and indeed sort of the previous answers, is that somebody with a complaint has to make sure that they put the right complaint into the right process and have categorised it in the right way. And that, that, that essentially that there's, there's, there's three or four different channels here and, and that you might essentially be putting the wrong block in the wrong hole in the box, so to speak. Yeah. I, I, if somebody either doesn't assess themselves correctly in the right category, how flexible is the process to, to redirect the, the, the complaint? 
Well, I, I would say it's, it's very flexible. Um, that online complaints process would come to our complaints assessment resolution unit. They would determine thereafter the most appropriate um, means of allocation and investigation. So there is that single point of entry, if you like. Similarly, the, um, the integrity matters portal and the whistleblowing forms that we use uh, would come into a single um, place, namely the, the National Gateway Assessment Unit. Um, so there are two, I, I suppose, points of entry, and both of which sit under professional standards department under my direction. Um, so that, that that consistency um, that I, I think you're looking for uh, would be achieved in terms of who might be best placed to determine um, the most appropriate means of carrying forward that inquiry. Finally, Ms McNeill, I mean, how would the SPA reflect on the system? Do they feel that it is straightforward and simple to use? Uh, uh, I think it's slightly different from Police Scotland only because uh, under the senior <laughs> officer... Sorry, I was actually asking for your reflections on, on the way the police the characterisation we've just heard from Police Scotland, the way they handle their... Complaints. Oh, sorry, yes, I, I, we, would, uh, we, we would support Police Scotland's approach. OK. I wonder if, Ms McNeill, I, I wasn't aware the SPA investigated itself. How many complaints have there been against the SPA? And what's the process for doing this? Um, I don't have those figures to hand today, so if you're happy, then I can follow that up after today's committee. But the process is very much in terms of the same process that all complaints come in. So they come into a dedicated team who then um, assess them and then take the, the complaints case to the Complaints and Conduct Committee for a determination. And should any member of staff be, you know, be part of that complaints case, then they wouldn't actually deal with it. Uh, and in some circumstances, we've actually had our head of legal actually look at those particular complaints away from the complaints team themselves. I have to say that um, I'm disappointed you've, you've come to the committee today to answer questions on complaints specifically, and you're unable to tell us how many complaints have been um, lodged um, against ASP. Where does the authority from this come? <coughs> Is it in the legislation? Is it in secondary re legislation that allows the SPA to investigate itself? I, I think in the 2012 Act, it, it references the SPA have to have uh, a complaints handling procedures in place. For? Um, it, it, for, for handling complaints, I, all complaints. And in the 2006 um, Act, um, it talks around uh, the definition of a relevant complaint. And obviously, the 2012 Act talks around the misconduct um, allegations for senior officers. Well, certainly from my point of view, there are huge transparency and accountability issues here. Um, we sit in the subcommittee. I wasn't aware of this. I doubt the general public is. Um, so having said that, is this an area that the SPA is actively looking at? Because they're not happy, obviously, with some of the regulations. We've talked about a lack of clarity and um, transparency. And this seems to me an obvious target for looking again. It's certainly something that we would actively welcome uh, and again our, our chair and our interim chief officer have looked to that in terms of our ongoing improvement journey and are very much engaged with the Demelish Angelini review. Could you provide the number of complaints against SP and the nature of these complaints and the outcome please? Of course. Right. John Finney. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Uh, Ms McNeill, I wonder if you could respond, please, to a view expressed by the Chief Police Officer Staff Association regarding Regulation 8 and their uh, view that a fair interpretation would be that the, the, the police authority undertakes some initial investigation prior to moving to a full investigation. And that particularly they express that view in relation to where anonymity applies, where it's an anonymous complaint. It's not an unreasonable th position. Again, I think when we have been looking at our own uh, improvements at our own hand and equally uh, engaging with the, the Day Mailish review, we have identified that there are issues with working with those regulations. Um, the, uh, there, there, we, we have received complaints through a number of routes, and some of which come by named individuals as well as anonymous complainers, and we are actively looking at that. Uh, and feeding back to our complaints committee around how we best deal with that going forward. That's part of our work with our new complaints handling procedures. I, I think I'm right saying that historically it, that there was a view taken whether a, an inquiry would be initiated. J just as a police officer, if someone comes and said, I've had my car stolen, they wouldn't immediately they would say, have you, are you sure you've not left it? 
some cursory examination surely is, is required for fairness to apply. And, and I think, uh, again, learning from experience, there has been a, a lack of clarity regarding how far we can conduct preliminary inquiries as, a, as opposed to tipping into what might be deemed an investigation. And, and that's where we're actually looking at what we can do in terms of our clarity, understanding of our own process, uh, working with PERC and also feeding into Dame Ailish's review. That, thank you very much. C can I ask uh, some questions about PERC, if I may, please? And I'm particularly interested in the relationship, Mr Hargreaves, that, 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 that there is um, about contemporaneous investigations and who would have primacy, because um, there might be issues about, for instance, the seizure of productions in a case. Uh, can you explain how that works and how that dovetails with the, the um, complaints process? Because clearly there are concerns if the PERC are involved. Okay. For, for them to be involved, I should say. Yeah, no, of course. Um, in, in terms of PERC investigations, are you referring to Mr Finney? Yes, indeed. Um, so PERC would obviously... We, we, the short answer, we'd have to work closely together, and it's very much uh, case-dependent um, you know, on, on what was required. But certainly we would always seek to cooperate with the PERC in terms of the provision of either documentation or any other ancillary evidence that would, that would facilitate their investigation. And who, who has primacy, Mr Hargreaves? In, in a, any investigation? If, if it's a part led investigation, then they would have that primacy and we would f obviously fully cooperate with that. Um, so if, it would de depend on the investigation. If, it is, um, if, it's, if Crown have instructed part to undertake an investigation, they would have that primacy. And, and has that always been the case? Uh, as far as I'm aware, Mr Finney, yes. And is, is it your view as a, someone who's in charge of a professional investigation on behalf of complaints against the police, is your view that whether, would, would you express a view whether PERC have a sufficiency of powers to undertake their job? I think that would be a matter for PERC to, to, to comment on, Mr Finney. I don't think that's for me. Has, has it been raised with you or your department at all? I'm, I'm aware of the, the PERC submission, um, obviously, in relation to this matter. Um, and it's something that we engage in on a, on a regular basis to try and obviously... Um, bring forward a process that is both effective and efficient in terms of com both complaint handling and investigations. And, and do you have a view of the relationship between uh, Police Scotland's inquiry system and, and a PERC investigation at the same time? Do you say the process works well? Do, oh, so do you mean where, whereby PERC are dealing with the same matter? With yes, indeed. I, 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 my, my personal opinion is I think a single process would be preferable. Um, I think that would make sense. If it's a victim-centred approach, then that, that would seem to me to make sense. And who, who, who in your view, should lead that process? If, if it's a part-led investigation, then it would make sense that they would, they would take that matter on. Right. Ms McNeill, do you have a, the authority have any view about these matters, about uh, simultaneous investigations involving Park and Police Scotland? I, I regret it's not something that I'm close to myself, so certainly we can get that view expressed back to the committee. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Jenny. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the panel. Just as a, a follow-up line of questioning uh, on the back of John Finney's questions there, I'm interested in the process whereby somebody reports a police complaint for the first time. Um, would you expect then, Mark Hargreaves, there, there to be a certain level of investigation at a local level before it goes to PERC? And is there a standardised way that that is dealt with, that there's guidance provided to local forces, for example, to carry out a level of investigation before it's escalated, as it were, to PERC? Absolutely. The first point of contact of entry into the Organisation for Complaints is, is absolutely Police Scotland, and we have that established uh, six-stage process. And um, as I was saying earlier, depending on the severity and nature of that complaint would determine the route that that complaint would take. But that would certainly come into a single source mm -hmm. and be assessed. Um, like I say, it can be resolved at either a frontline level, so that would yep. essentially mean a very kind of um, expedited process, but to the satisfaction of that member of the public who had cause to complain. Um, they then have the recourse to, if they're not satisfied with that, they, they can request a fuller investigation, which we would undertake. If they remain dissatisfied with the outcome of that investigation, they have, of course, that right of recourse to the park for non-criminal matters. And if it's a criminal matter about which they are complaining, uh, they have the right of recourse to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. OK, thank you. Um, and just as a supplementary question um, to Lindsay McNeill, um, in terms of your evidence, I note here that you say that the SPA complaints team are a team of three people. Um, is there an issue around about capacity, therefore, if you've only three folk investigating these complaints? Do you need more? I think everybody that goes before you to say, yes, we could always do with more resources. Mm. Um, however, I think there is a, 
that is that is looking we're looking at that as part of our improvement journey uh, to assess the, the who, the what, the why, uh, how, who's best to, to do what and in which circumstances. Um, we, I have to be careful because we, because we have the different categorisation of complaints, we're not allowed to investigate misconduct, so mm -hmm. it's preliminary inquiries, whereas if it's a relevant complaint, i.e. a type of complaint that has a, a recourse option to perk, then we are we do have to conduct some inquiries. So um, we, we are streamlining our working processes, but uh, additional resources are always good. Thank you. Okay, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, very briefly, uh, to begin with, you talked quite a lot about the importance of process, importance of process, and sticking to it, and the authority for the complaints process. Where does a concept of special leave fit in with that? Uh, and assuming it's not a specific process that I can go and look at, who has authority to instigate a special leave? Against what criteria, and what process will apply when the process has gone off piste, as it were? Sorry, is that a special leave in regards to...? Well, we saw this time last, last year, I think, that uh, rather than a specific process being followed, uh, in a particular situation, a concept of special leave was, uh, was used. Uh, so was that something that just came out of nowhere, or is there a process that I can look at to investigate special leave? Uh, so this, this is with regards to a specific of, uh, case. Uh, it's not something that, that I can comment on, uh, being a, a set of circumstances and not something I was party to, uh, not being at work at the time. I'm not familiar with, with uh, what that process, and it may be something you may wish to take up with the chair when she appears before you at the end of the month. Let me, let me maybe ask it a different way then, because it's not really about the specific case. It's more about we are looking at specific processes and whether they work or not, but it would appear from events last year that someone has authority to say, here are all our processes, let's do something different that isn't mandated by regula <coughs> regulations. Uh, is that the case? And if so, who has that authority? I think that's something that I would have to take back and make sure that we look at in and around in terms of our ongoing improvements. Uh, moving on to uh, something that came up in our papers, the complaints process uh, is dropped, I think, when officers retire or when they resign. Uh, some people have certainly suggested that this is deeply unsatisfactory, both for those who have made a complaint uh, but also for those who have been accused. Do either of you take a view on whether this should change? And if so, given uh, your comments earlier, Ms McNeil, uh, should this be by amendment to regulations? So I, I can take that first, if, if that's OK. Um, what I would say here is it's really important to make that distinction between complaints and conduct. If a member of the public makes a complaint about a member of the police or a police officer, then that complaint will continue even and conclude even where that police officer leaves the organisation it is whether or not that complaint amounts to conduct which is assessed as misconduct that would not be progressed in the event of the officer leaving whether by resignation or retiring mm -hmm. and do you have a view on whether that should change in the latter case um, i think that is something that we, we would um, I, I can see the frustration both for the, the member of the public who has had cause to complain, at, but equally to the officer who may, who may wish that opportunity to defend his, his or herself. Um, I think it's something that, that probably needs to be explored in further detail. Um, I, I don't have a definitive view. I can, I can see arguments for both sides. Ms. Har uh, Ms. McNeil. I have to concur with Mr Hargreaves. We work very hard to work within the parameters of what we are and are not allowed to do, uh, and certainly any, any consideration of future legislation or regulations could, could consider that in and around. It, it could consider it, of course, but do you take a view as the SPA on whether it should change, whether it is unsatisfactory, as some have suggested? I think we need to understand the broader issues because we're looking at the, the lessons learned in England and Wales as well in terms of what they've done in the past and what they're changing. So I, I think we'd like to understand um, a wider evidence review. Final thing from me. Uh, do you have a view that the PERC have suggested uh, that Section 33AB of the Public Order and Criminal Justice Act of 2006 should be extended? 
uh, which they feel would enable them to investigate those who have previously been employed by uh, a policing body. Do you have a view on whether that should take place? I, I am aware of Perk's submission, and again, I think that as part of the email issues review, I think that will be looked at in and around, and again, we will consider our position in regards to that matter and, and where resources best lie. Mr Hargreaves, do you have a view? I'm certainly aware of the, the complications that can arise as a result of what is essentially is a, a twin-track investigation. Um, what I would say is any process or any change that would result in an improved service to both the subject officers and members of the public is something that we would, we would welcome and we would look at. Thank you. I'm a bit concerned, Ms Neil. Um, you've now referred to the Dame uh, Ailish uh, review several times. You're here to answer questions about your processes in SBE for complaints to this committee now, not to, to look at it in a few months' time and consider it, but to answer these questions now. And there's several things we've asked you you don't appear to have the answers to. So can we have written evidence on the procedure for special leave, the special leave process on any ongoing complaints. Could the committee have that in respect? And I hope um, this is noted. I mean, have we got the wrong person in front of us today? Do you consider someone else should have been here answering these questions about complaint handling? No, convener. I am the director in charge of complaints handling procedures. Uh, having since returned to work full time in June, I have uh, worked with a team, worked with a committee, uh, and we're currently taking on board various lessons learned. You, you know, we ab we absolutely welcome the Ailish Angelini review because, actually, as our own chair has said since she uh, took up post in December, she feels that the system is broken, and she's she's very keen to look for system wide review. I would hope you would be doing that now and not waiting for a review, and especially in preparation to appearing before this committee. I can't put it any more strongly than that. John. Uh, Mr Hargreaves, there's, there's a lot of commentary about the issue of officers retiring and, quote, uh, avoiding um, proceedings. I wonder if you'd take the opportunity to confirm my understanding. That is, that if a, a member of the public makes a, a, a complaint that infers criminality, then nothing uh, alters the fact that that will be treated as a, as, um, a matter directed by the Crown Office Property to Fiscal Service, um, regardless of whether the individual retires or not. Mr Finney, that's correct. Um, if a member of the public makes a complaint which is considered to be criminal in nature, then that would be referred to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, in particular the criminal allegations against the police division of that service, and that investigation would continue, because essentially it's a criminal matter and it would be put before our courts if that was deemed the appropriate route to take, So, uh, regardless of whether that officer retired or resigned. OK, thank you very much indeed. OK, who's next? Rona. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, I'd like to ask you about the time taken to investigate and conclude, uh, conclude complaints. We've had written submissions which um, highlight lengthy delays that go way beyond the 56-day um, deadline. So I wonder if you could tell me your views on that, um, how it can be improved and, and why, why that would be happening. Um, I think there are a number of reasons um, why a complaint might extend beyond the 56 days. It would depend on the, the number and, um, of allegations, for example, the complexity of those allegations, the number of witnesses um, that are required to be seen, um, the, the volume of evidence that would require to be ingathered uh, to ensure that a full and thorough investigation is undertaken. The time taken, in fact, to agree what I've, I've referred to earlier is that heads of complaint, which can often be a lengthy process to come to an agreement with usually the member of the public, about what it is that they would like us to investigate. Um, all of that being said, I, I recognise that there absolutely is room for improvement um, and that on occasion you know, it's taken a lot longer than I would personally like. Um, so a lot of these complaints um, um, are dealt with by you know, local policing divisions, specialist areas of the business. And in that regard, we are continually working with those areas of the business to identify areas of best practice um, to improve the process for complaint handling um, and in ways that we can expedite that matter whilst not compromising the, the quality of that investigation. So should there be different time scales depending on the complexity of the complaint because surely it would take much less time to uh, investigate a fairly straightforward complaint to something that's much more um, intricate as you've suggested? 
Yeah, the, the, the time period of 56 days refers to what I would call the kind of standard complaint process, but you're right, that, that can be anything from um, something which is deemed either not suitable by the member of the public or by dint of it being known uh, not suitable for frontline resolution. That would automatically fall into the 56 days. Um, there are some complaints which are not suitable for frontline resolution, which can and are completed within that 56 day timescale. But equally, there are, there are other complaints which are either criminal or non-criminal, or, as a matter of fact, both uh, in nature, um, that, would that do require uh, to go beyond that 56 days. I think the, the key for us, and it's written into our standard operating procedures, is that we maintain contact with the member of the public, again, usually, who's making that complaint, to understand that they, uh, to ensure, sorry, that they understand why there, there is a perceived delay in the investigation, and to ensure um, that we have their confidence that the matter is progressing at a, an appropriate pace. Okay, you mentioned the standard operating procedure. What, what's the status of that document? Is that is it complete? I mean, is that what you work to at the moment? That that is what we work to at the moment, um, and that that's that's under you know regular review. Um, but that that is what we work to at the moment. Okay. And that's and based on sorry, that was based on documentation initially yeah. provided by the park. And so, should there be statutory requirements for the length of time taken to consider complaints, and should the police, public order, and criminal justice? Act be amended, as, as Perker suggesting, to define the timescales. Um, you, you already said you, you, you don't believe in amending that Act, but should it be amended in, in respect of timescales? I, I don't necessarily think it's necessary to amend the legislation, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think that 56-day timescale is, is more or less suitable. Um, there are, as I said, occasions when it does take longer than we would like, um, sometimes through necessity, sometimes there are absolutely occasions when we could improve upon that. And, and as I said, I'm working with the local policing divisions and, of course, my own team to improve upon that. OK, because I mean, I'm sure you appreciate how frustrating it is if people make a complaint to have to wait three months and more for, for any you know, conclusion, sometimes even response, to be quite honest, yeah. No, no, I, absolutely, and that's yeah. why I would encourage, you know, certainly my team and the local policing divisions that where the complaint is going to extend beyond that 56 day period that we maintain contact in the same way that we would with any other investigation mm -hmm. to, to ensure the member of the public understands why something might take longer than that, that kind of uh, average of, of 56 days that we use, that guideline. And with regard to the SPA, uh, Ms McNeill, how does the how are the time skills working there? Um, I, I would reflect on what Mr Hargreaves has said. Certainly, we, we are subject to the same uh, time scales as suggested by PERC. We do endeavour to work towards them. The, the nature of some of the complaints that we get in do tend to be quite complex to try and unpick uh, and compare with the regulations and uh, standards of professional behaviour. Uh, again, there are times when we have exceeded those timescales. We do endeavour to keep our, um, our complainers up to date uh, once a month, uh, and, and then obviously we give them a progress as to when complaints go to the Complaints and Conduct Committee for determination as well. So you engage with the complainant once a month? Indeed. Okay. Can I ask you? if you keep a, a record of the timescales that are exceeded? Yes, we do. Could we have that, please? Thank yes, you. of course. Fulton. I uh, can be just a very um, a short supplementary question, because I think uh, my line of questions have been broadly answered, and I want to thank the panel for coming in. I would like to highlight as well that I think it's important, as you mentioned last week, convener, that we always treat um, panellists uh, with respect uh, when they're in front of us. Uh, it was more a question for Mark Harveys, following on from Rona McKay, uh, Mackay's question, and um, what that contact with members of the public would, would look like in practice. Whether, uh, I know we talked about it was once a month there, but what, yeah. what would it look like? Would it be a phone call? Would it be a, a discussion in person? Would it be a visit? So I think, I think the short answer to that is it, it really depends on what that member of the public would prefer as that, that uh, medium, if you like. Some people would prefer a phone call. Some people might prefer an email. Some people actually you know, might prefer no contact until the complaint is resolved, or, or at least they have a response um, to the complaint resolved. might be too strong a word, of course, if they're not satisfied, but concluded, I would say, from an initial complaint handling perspective. Um, so, but we would encourage contact in whatever form is appropriate or is, is asked for by that member of the public, okay. which can, of course, be different. I'm happy with that. Shona. Uh, yeah, can I thank both panellists for your, um, your uh, responses? I think both have answered in a, an open and transparent manner. Um, what is the SPA's role in in scrutinising the time taken to consider criminal complaints. Um, we've heard about the standard operating procedure in response to, to Rowan Mackay's 
uh, question earlier on, but I'd like to probe a little bit more about how the SBA ensure that Police Scotland follows the standard operating procedure. And if we're not going to have that in statute, how do we ensure that that, that is the case? What other levers can be used? So, in, in relation to general complaints handling, that's part of the, the regular performance reporting that Police Scotland bring to the Complaints and Conduct Committee. So, they report in public on a quarterly basis, and that includes things such as timescales. You did, ref you did mention there about criminal allegations. Mm -hmm. So, what we do, both from an SPA's um, perspective in terms of our own complaints, but also in relation to Police Scotland complaints that are referred to the Crown, is we have regular dialogue with the Crown uh, on a kind of operational basis to work out where the status of different complaints are. And we've recently started a four-party meeting between ourselves, Police Scotland, Park and the Crown to sit down with a, a professional roundtable discussion to highlight kind of <coughs> issues across the system to work out where we can best improve collectively. And would you look at then an analysis of those that are breaching the, the time frames? Would you have a, like almost like a warning um, flag that says that's going to be breaching the, the time frame? So how are we going to avoid that happening? Is there, does that happen? So uh, absolutely, at the, at, within SPA at the moment, we're, we're the, the Complaints and Conduct Committee had commissioned us to do this five-year look back anyway in terms of what we've done before, what were the time skills, what were the lessons learned. But actually, as an ongoing basis just now, we're looking at all our complaints to see where are they, where are they, how much time have they been taken, and, and how do we uh, bring them to a, a close one way or another. Uh, and actually, there's been a substantive piece of work recently to reduce the backlog of complaint cases, um, which had been progressed at the last two committee meetings. So that would include an analysis of where the problem lies and what is it that's taking the time and how can that be resolved? Yes. Okay, thank you. Oh, questioning. Can I thank the witnesses for attending? We look forward to the additional information you both um, indicated you are going to provide the committee. I spend briefly to allow uh, the witnesses to leave.
Agenda item two is an evidence session as part of our pre-budget scrutiny ahead of the publication of the Scottish Government's budget 2019-20 later this year. And I invite Liam Kerr to um, make a declaration of interest. Uh, simply to say that I'm uh, a member of the Law Society of England and Wales and separately of Scotland and hold practising certificates with both. I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk, and paper four, which is a private paper. We'll hear from um, the, the first panel, two panels uh, on this subject. The first one being from the Crown Office and Procurator Fisco on the Scottish <laughs> Courts Tribunal Service for the purpose of tackling sexual crime and domestic violence. And I welcome Fiona Eady, Secretary, Procurator Fisco uh, Society Section, FDA Union. Stephen Murray, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service Branch, and Brian Carroll, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service Branch, PCS Union. And can I thank all the witnesses for the written submissions, which, as always, is very, very helpful to the committee. Um, we now move to questions, starting with one from Shona. Good morning. Uh, it's a question on, on funding um, and really to explore what the um, impact that is going to be of the, the in-year uh, additional funding to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service of, of up to 3.6 million uh, in this financial year and really what will what difference it's going to make, what's the impact, what will it mean for, for the service? Is that anybody in particular? Uh, uh, I'll start okay, then. You start. <laughs> okay. um, well, FDA very much welcomes uh, the additional funding. Um, we've been here uh, on, on several occasions before um, arguing that additional funding was required mm. uh, for the, the fiscal service um, in order to um, tackle the, the, the challenges it, it has in relation to the increase in uh, serious uh, and in particular uh, the increase in serious sexual offending mm -hmm. um, that we, we've dealt with and the committee will be well familiar I think with some of the challenges that um, have been explained about the complexity of dealing with that type of casework. Um, one of our main um, requests uh, in recent years has been for an increase in staffing. The additional funding uh, has been allocated to fund a recruitment of up to uh, 140 new members of staff mm -hmm. um, and around about 60 of those will be new lawyers. Um, that we hope uh, will alleviate some of the, 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 the pressures on our colleagues um, who are required to, to deliver the service um, and also to alleviate some of the, 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 the stresses on, on them in doing that. Um, and the intention, obviously, we understand that that money comes with uh, a requirement to provide uh, an improved uh, service for the public. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we hope that this will, um, will assist in, in doing that. I think we've set out in our paper um, some of the, uh, the, the, the provisos or the, the words of caution that we would uh, provide in relation to how quickly uh, that transformation can be expected to take place, because we don't think that uh, recruitment in and of itself um, will be a solution uh, overnight to that issue. Yes, um, just to say that as far as PCS are concerned, um, we are um, v very much welcome the, um, the, the increase in budget and the fact that the, the government has listened to the, the concerns not only of the unions but of COPFS management. Uh, it's fair enough to say that the casework is changing within the service. There's an increase in more complex cases which uh, take longer to get through and also longer to, uh, to get into court. Um, and while we, increase the, while we welcome the increase in funding for the sexual offences and domestic offences, we would like to note that um, other parts of the organisation have been asked for an increase in budget and they've also been given it, which is very much to giving a better service to the public. As a union, uh, I think we will be monitoring the situation to ensure that um, no special preference is given to anyone at the expense of any others in the service. Uh, you know, uh, just to make sure that things are an even keel in that respect. And um, as the main union rep for PCS, 
I've had concerns about uh, the number of staff uh, who have been off with workplace stress uh, in the, the last couple of years. I think there's been um, uh, very much, um, since the, the, the days of the austerity measures in the last 10 years or so, I think that, that, that it's put a lot of pressure on uh, our members in PCS. And the, 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 the increase in budget is very much welcome, not only for the service, but within the, from the staff and from the unions also. I mean, that's quite a quite a large number of additional staff, and you know, 60 of 140 will be lawyers. I mean, presumably, in terms of the priorities for that spend, it will be aligned with the the priorities set out, um, in, in terms of how to um, what the what the priorities are for the service, and indeed the requirement to improve. Um, you said. You know, there's maybe no quick fixes. It's maybe going to take time for that to show in improved performance and a better service to the public. What kind of time frame would you think is realistic in that respect? Um, I think perhaps some of my, my colleagues in uh, uh, senior management of the organisation would be better placed to uh, provide you with, with that sort of um, estimate. What I would say, though, um, and we've made some obser observations about it again in, in our written mm. submission, um, is that... Um, you know, as has been previously observed and, and, and accepted, uh, you can't you can't grow fiscals overnight. Mm. Uh, they don't grow on trees. I think was mm. the the term used by a previous solicitor general. Um, and you know, there there is a beyond the regular. Um, uh, training required for all solicitors. Uh, it's a very specific post mm -hmm. um, with specific sort of demands uh, and, and skills and expertise that you develop over a period of time. Um, I think we've indicated that we don't support our current um, accreditation system that, mm -hmm. that operates in COPFS. Accreditation is, this, is the, a requirement for a further two-year training period uh, to acquire some of those those skills. Uh, we have some issues about how that operates. Um, in particular, we don't think that it, it, it's fair um, that it comes with a, a financial penalty. penalty. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's on a suppressed salary. Um, but that's, that's, it's, it's a two-year process. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, as I say, I think it would probably be for other um, others to say what time limit, uh, sorry, what time expectation there would be for, to, for, to um, provide uh, the changes that are referred to. But um, I would have thought that um, that kind of two-year period is the, the, the period of time, assuming that we can recruit um, all the, the required staff that, that we need, um, then you would expect to see experienced, um, more more, more experienced uh, uh, legal staff dealing with these cases within that sort of period of time. And presumably, given their permanent staff, this would be a baseline within the, the budget going forward in order to maintain... Well... That, that's uh, the assumption. Yes, that, yeah. that, that is the assumption. OK. Uh, I'm here representing uh, PCS members from Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. From our perspective, we welcome the increased funding uh, for COPs and there's no issues around that per se, apart from the fact that if there is to be the increase in staff that is anticipated here, including 60 new lawyers, we anticipate the capacity for uh, the business to be dealt with by co-ops, obviously, to increase, which therefore may increase the business coming through to Scottish courts and tribunal service, not only in court business, and indeed, uh, as we're seeing in trends at the moment, the business is getting more uh, complex, therefore taking more time to go through the courts. Therefore, there may be a, a need for uh, increased staff, as we would see it for Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, to deal with that increase. Also, depending on how cases are marked, it might not just be the business going through the court that would increase, but also um, fines enforcement, uh, might increase in that respect as well, because obviously when fiscals are marking papers, they do have the opportunity to put things to, to direct measures. So there'll be an increase on, on business there. I would also like to mention about the electronic monitoring, which may come on later from other questions, but it may be worth mentioning that just now. 
in that I think it was in one of the uh, responses um, that it was mentioned that Scottish Government are anticipating that if electronic monitoring increases, there would be a, no impact on the, or little impact on the agencies dealing with that electronic monitoring. But in Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, we deal with the imposition, the revocation, and possibly the reimposition of these orders. And these are very complex. Taking overall, if you've got 10 orders coming in, that doesn't look very much. But again, it's about the administrative work that goes behind that to put these orders uh, through the court. So we're anticipating uh, an increase in, in business in that respect as well. Okay. So we would like to see, I suppose what I'm saying is, if there's increased funding for one part of the justice sector, then there should be increased funding for other parts of the justice sector. But I would also say that in relation to what uh, Stephen said previously, we would not want to see that increased funding to the detriment of any other funding, including revenue funding, which includes salaries. Thank you. Uh, I, I think you, it's very well made in your um, submission the, the impact of more elec well breaches of elec uh, electronic monitoring. Um, can we ask, given there are some um, financial constraints there that you, you're already I identifying, have you made any representation to the Scottish Government in, in this respect that flagging up you, re additional resources will be required? Not uh, personally, PCS I don't think have, I think our medium would be through this uh, Justice Committee. It may be that Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service themselves have uh, maybe had discussions through the, the Scottish Criminal Justice Board and other uh, mediums, but certainly PCS, not at this moment in time. And that's why we're obviously here today to mention it to yourselves. Okay. Well, you certainly got it on record today. Okay, thank you. Liam Kerr. Very briefly, if I may, Convener, just uh, Fiona Edie on the 60 new lawyers point that you're making to my colleague. Uh, you talked about the training and, and how to get these people on board. Uh, the current reality is it does operate, as you've described in your submission, uh, and I don't think there's any uh, realistic prospect of changing that or any move to change that in the near future. Given also that uh, I think it would be fair to say it's not the best paid branch of the profession, uh, and I think elsewhere in the submission a, a significant number have left to join the Scottish Government. Uh, so does that not suggest that even if you can recruit the full 60, uh, what's actually going to change to improve retention going forward, such that we don't end up recruiting the whole lot and then off they go again? Can I, I, I agree with the main thrust of your question there. Um, can I just check when you say that the, the current reality is operating, that nothing's likely to change in the near future, to, to what are you referring? Uh, I'm not aware of anything. You may have a, a different view. Uh, yeah. which I'd be keen to hear. So, I mean, the, as I say, there are there's the two separate stages for training um, for solicitors and in particular for uh, procurators fiscal. There's the, the, two stage, the, the first stage, which is just your trainee solicitor that you would do if you were going to go and work anywhere as a, as a lawyer, as a solicitor. Um, and then COPFS themselves have their own um, uh, system which is called accreditation um, and um, it's something that we we hoped that that particular uh, system is something we co hope to keep on the table uh, for review um, uh, so um, I would be hopeful that, that, that we can continue discussions on how we might be able to um, improve uh, that that particular um, uh, aspect of, of training for our lawyers but Going back to the, um, the, the rest of your question, um, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I mean, it's, we, we've just undertaken uh, a recruitment exercise in the last uh, few weeks. Um, it, it was confirmed yesterday um, that I think it's round about 24 new staff, uh, new lawyers that, that we're, we're taking on, which as I say is, is very welcome. Um, 
I don't have the precise figures uh, in relation to those who have left in particular to go off to the Scottish Government, um, but, cert but anecdotally, um, I know that it's a significant portion um, and uh, we outlined um, in, in our submission that many of those have gone off on significantly um, increased salaries. And our point is that, you know, we don't wish to, to devalue the, the work uh, that, that um, colleagues in Scottish Government undertake. There's value in the work that, that, that everybody there does, uh, the legal department and those in the, the, the various policy branches. Um, our point is that how can it be right for uh, the, the lawyers who have to deal with um, victims and witnesses um, of, of crime who prosecute um, uh, sort of child sexual offences, um, some of the most serious and violent offenders in Scotland, uh, to, to be remunerated um, so significantly less than um, their, their Scottish Government counterparts. Um, so that is something that we will be continuing um, to make the, make the case there. Um, because, as, a, as a, again, we outlined in our, in our written evidence, um, we know that when the business case went in uh, to the Finance Secretary in relation to this additional funding, it was very much um, uh, specifically for, the, for recruitment. It wasn't for um, enhanced salaries for existing staff. Um, our concern um, is that in, it, it, recruitment is only part of the solution. Retention is a key part of it, um, and unless we can retain uh, our existing staff, and unless we can be the most attractive uh, employer and be competitive um, in that particular market, um, then actually, some you know the the the, the commitments um, which are made. Uh, it, that were made in terms of this business case to secure the additional funding may not be deliverable. Um, <coughs> I wonder if I can come in there as well, uh, just to, to state that, that uh, on the admin side, um, PCS are very concerned about the, the level of staff turnover, uh, who, of staff who are leaving for Scottish Government places, which seems to be down to pay disparity, which is something that we will be looking to raise in future pay negotiations. It should also be noted as well that despite the extra uh, finance, which is very, very welcome, uh, COPFS are still continuing with their estates review. And as a union, we will be um, uh, vigorously opposing any proposed office closures which might affect the service we provide to the public and also the, to the impact which it would have on PCS members. And finally, just to say, um, uh, on the subject of pay, we would like to, to state that future funding for COPFS has to meet ministerial commitments on pay which have been given to PCS officials previously. Uh, Mr Carroll, yeah. Yeah, I would just like to echo uh, what Stephen said there just now in terms of the uh, staff within SCTS. Staff going from uh, other departments into Scottish Government is not unique to COPS uh, or indeed SCTS. We have staff who are regularly transferring over to Scottish Government main because of the, the better pay scales. And I think that's an argument for having a cohesive a pay policy across a Scottish Government main, taking in a, into account all agencies in the, in the Scottish sector, which would assist in the uh, issue that you uh, raised there, uh, Liam. And in respect of that, we would like to see the Cabinet Secretary for Finance uh, you know, live up to the commitments that were made to staff about restoring the value of public sector workers' pay, especially in the justice sector, where all three organisations in the justice sector had a uh, difficulty in, in meeting uh, the, the base requirements of the, of the, the pay policy. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Just following up a couple of lines of question. Firstly, in relation to the um, additional capacity that, that is going to be en enabled through the, the, uh, the in-year funding, do you have a sense of the kind of proportion of where that's going to rest? You talked about the complexity of cases, but also the, the, the higher prevalence, the growing prevalence of sexual and domestic um, violence or abuse cases. I'm sure you won't be able to put an, a, 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 an actual number on it, but the proportion of the, 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 the extra um, staff that are coming in, uh, how's that going to be split um, in terms of meeting that demand in relation to sexual violence cases? and then other pressures of demand in, in other areas that Stephen Murray was talking about? Um, 
you're right, I can't put a figure on it. Um, senior management from CLPFS may be able to, to do that when, when I'm sure you'll hear from them at some point in, in this process. Um, I, I can give you a sort of uh, a, a, a feel uh, for it and, and um, the, the, the kind of information that, that's coming to me from um, members. And it, it's borne out, I think, by the, um, the, the department's own stated commitment to tackling um, serious crime and, in particular, the serious sexual offending. Um, there, there has been a lot of movement internally within the organisation of people moving into our high court function um, and uh, in particular into those teams that, that deal with uh, sexual offence matters. So um, that is, is where I would say that the, the majority um, of the focus has been in recent time. Um, we, we have asked the question and received some reassurances um, that that should not be at the expense of other parts of the organisation. So um, we, our, our, our work is, is, is split up into um, sort of three main functions, which is our, our local courts, our summary courts, our sheriff and jury courts, um, and then the uh, serious case work and the high court work. Um, our concern, um, and it, it goes back to the point that we were making about sort of training and development and um, where people are likely to be located when they're recruited, uh, we would be very concerned, frankly, if people were, you know, inex inexperienced staff were being recruited into the organisation and placed directly in to deal with the serious casework, the sexual offence cases. Um, uh, again, there are, there are reasons why that, that shouldn't happen in terms of our own uh, internal procedures. Um, so the anxiety that is coming to us from um, members in the in the local court function um, is that they will be the ones who will bear the burden of doing the majority of the training and development and coaching, mentoring, and and, and developing colleagues uh, within that um, part of the organisation um, because. In the main, what we would expect to see is, your, is the experienced uh, prosecutors moving in to deal with the, 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 the serious casework and the um, uh, and the high court work. Um, I can't really be any more specific than to say that, that that's, the, that's the picture that we've seen um, and some of the potential um, areas of concern that we're monitoring. And in terms of Mr. Carroll's point about the 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 volume impact of the investment going into COP and PFS on other parts of the, the system, notably courts and tribunal service. I mean, there's a suggestion that um, there are cases not being taken forward at the moment because th those resources aren't there in COPs, um, or is the additional resource going to lead to a, a more efficient running of COPs that therefore shouldn't create a bulge elsewhere in the, the, the system? I mean, what's, what's your impression of that? Um, I wouldn't suggest that there are cases which are not currently being progressed, which, but for additional funding or additional staff resource, would otherwise have been. Mm -hmm. um, what what I would say is that there are um, uh, there is work ongoing at looking at some of our internal processes to make them as efficient as possible, um, uh, and um, what. One of, the, one of the areas that we very much hope um, that this additional funding um, will provide is greater capacity and resilience within the organisation. So that what I, what I would be wanting to see, and I think what all of us within COPFS would want to see, because our staff are, are sort of hardworking, committed professionals trying to deliver the very best service that they can, um, is to, to, to provide um, additional time for preparation um, that it, it, it's an area of our work that, that we've been um, talking about for some time because we know that it creates significant stress uh, for, for our members when they, don't, when they have inadequate time to, to prepare cases. Um, uh, and so 
we would, we would be hoping that, in fact, the additional uh, staff will prov provide some extra resilience and capacity for people to, 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 to be well prepared when they go into so court. So would that reduce the problems of churn that we've, we've heard about uh, in, in our earlier inquiry, or will it, would, it, would it speed up the, 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 the time taken to take cases forward, which may address what Mr Carl was talking about in terms of the volume that they are seeing. It, it's quicker. It's not necessarily more, but it's coming through the system. Um, churn, churn is that, it's, it's quite a complex issue. There are a lot of factors yeah, that, that, that influence it. Um, uh, so, but I, I would say that um, the, more, the more time staff have to prepare the cases, um, the, the better that is for everybody uh, and as a, as a factor that contributes towards uh, churn, then that should have a, a positive impact. Okay. So, Mr. Carroll. I, I can see where you're, yeah. where you're going with that, Liam. But I would come back and say, yeah, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service uh, work collaboratively with all uh, justice partners. And one of the areas is looking at trends and uh, the, business, the business coming through. Certainly from a, a PCS administrative point of view, we want to see the service to the public um, being the, the service that the people of Scotland uh, want and indeed deserve, being the democratic nation that we, that we are and justice being part of, of that democracy. And what we need to be delivering to the people of Scotland is a, an effective, efficient uh, service. However, I do feel still that notwithstanding what has been said, that there will be an increase uh, in business coming through, not just in high court cases, but also possibly uh, the summary uh, cases as well. Because we can't forget that there's the, the JP courts here, there's also the sheriff courts as well as the, the high court. Mm -hmm. And all I feel would be affected by the increase in staff, although the focus will be, uh, and I accept that, that the, the focus will be on the, the high end cases, uh, that this, this money is uh, to go towards. But I think over time, as I've put in my submissions, as that gets better, then time would be freed up to uh, then focus on other areas of the, of the justice system. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Daniel, brief stuff from Lenty. Um, I just really wanted to go back to a, a comment both Fiona Eady and, and Stephen uh, Murray alluded to in terms of pay disparity. Um, I was just wondering if, if you could both quantify that, both in terms of uh, lawyers and administrative staff, in terms of the disparity between uh, the COPFS and Scottish Government. Um, yes, I can. Um, it might be better, perhaps, um, following this session, we could pr provide copies um, to the, the committee that, 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 that show the, um, the pay ranges. Um, but... Um, I mean, even roughly, I mean, is it sort of 10% well, less? Is it half? I mean, what, 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 roughly, what, 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 what are you roughly... What I can say, uh, and we mentioned it in our, in our submission, is that we, we have colleagues who have moved over from uh, COPFS, certainly within the... the and it's the first first lawyer tier, if you like, the first lawyer grade within COPFS, who have moved over um, essentially on a level transfer to Scottish Government, and they're being paid in excess of £10,000 more. Right. That's helpful. It's a big difference. <laughs> big difference. And, uh, uh, Mr Murray? Yeah, just to say that, <clears throat> uh, that in my experience uh, firsthand, from speaking to people who are leaving the service and, and the admin grades, uh, when they go to Scottish Government, the, the feedback that we get is that the, the reason they're leaving is not per because they're particularly unhappy in COPFS. It's because of basically that there, uh, there is more money being offered by Scottish Government across the grades. I don't have any particularly specific um, figures for you. I could look into, look into that and get back to you. That, but that would be helpful. We're really just talking about feedback here from people who leave, and I think it's becoming a concern in, in, in both unions that we are losing a lot of good people. Uh, because the perception is, rightly or wrongly, that they're earning more money uh, with the, the Scottish Government on, on the, in, a, in another department. C can I just also very briefly ask you, you mentioned workplace stress. Yeah. I mean, how significant a problem is that, and what is the source of it? Is it workload, or are there other issues at play? Well, I, I am the, the, the main um, PCS rep for the, the, ad, the admin grades, and the, in, in my workload, there has been an increase in the number of people being off with workplace stress. 
Uh, that this is down to various factors. It could, be, it could be down to pressure of work. It could be down to relations with managers, etc. But I, I do feel that now that we're, we're getting the extra funding and the extra staffing coming in, that that's something that, that will help to alleviate that. It's very much welcomed across the board by staff and unions alike that we are getting more staff in to help. Uh, and I think in terms of the, the pressures that staff face on a daily basis, this can only be a good thing. Can I perhaps just come, come back on a, a point there, which is, yes, um, it, it was really just to say that, um, you know, you're absolutely right. It's not my place to um, to, 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 to put down or, or criticise in any way uh, the work being done um, in, in other parts of the the, the, uh, the public sector and, and other sort of government lawyers. Um, but I do think that there is a particular stress uh, that, that prosecutors have to face because of the nature of the work that they're dealing with. Particularly, we've already explored the, the increase in, in, in serious cases and serious sexual offending cases. Um, I mean, we have arrangements in place place for vicarious trauma support uh, for people who are uh, undertaking that work um, over a lengthy period of time. Um, but I think that, that, that it's, it, it's also a factor that plays in people's minds when they think about, well, actually, I could go over and I could sit in an office dealing with, you know, rut not routine, a different type of work that doesn't bring those additional uh, stresses and anxieties um, and, and be paid more. I think we understand it's a point well made. Thank you. OK, John. Thank you, Camilla. Uh, we've covered quite a bit of ground already. Um, I, I was going to ask about whether the targeting of funding was appropriate to, to placing, and it seems to be that there's general consensus that you know a business case was built around that and, and, and there is support for it. But I'm interested on uh, the issue when we looked into, when we did our review and we were concerned about the number of temporary staff that were in place. Are these additional post going to be offset with that and perhaps Mr Murray if you could expand on your comment you made if I hopefully noted you correctly where you talked about concerns about special preference being given. Please. It's not so much special preference as such, it was targeting areas of work, I mean it's mentioned in there that uh, sexual offences, domestic cases uh, which are very um, significant um, crimes and should be looked at separately, that, that serious stuff. But the, um, the, 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 my, my role in, 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 as a union rep is to ensure that uh, if there is any pressures, that not, that doesn't get transferred to somewhere else and, and, and at the expense of other areas. Now, I don't believe that to be the case at the moment because COPS, COPFS management have assured us that uh, across the board they have been given the extra finance, that, that every function who asked for in, the increased finance has been given it. So uh, I hope that that being the case, then that that won't be a that, that won't be a factor. In terms of the, the temporary staff that you, that you 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 mentioned, that has been an issue, particularly with the admin grades for for some time. I do have to say that, that, that it, the good news is that uh, there has been recruitment, and it's permanent recruitment. And the crown agent himself has given us a a, a guarantee that that he is very much interested in having people who who are going to be placed there permanently because it gives them more of a, a stake in, in the organisation and, and you, you probably get more from them. Can I just clarify then, there was concerns expressed in our report about the, 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 these numbers. Mm. Was that a process that was put in place or are the replacement of some of these country contracts with permanent staff part of that 80, if we take away the 60 new lawyers from the 140? Was it, was it happening anyway in advance of this? It has been happening in advance. I have to say that that's something that the PCS very much welcome. And, uh, but we're on the right track in that respect. I don't think there's any great desire to go back to the days of having uh, great numbers of temporary staff there, which is, isn't good for anybody, anybody's concern, whether it's the individual employee or the, the actual employer. Indeed. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Um, Daniel. I, mean, I think in the main, my, my question I was going to ask was about whether or not this funding needs to be long term, and I think you've, you've already answered that, but I'm just wondering if there's a view as to whether or not this increase in the volume of serious sexual offences is something that's going to continue into the future, or whether it's a, a sort of a, 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 a short or medium term bulge in, in, in uh, demand. Uh, I'm just wondering if there was a view on that. Um, I... I don't have the the figures about, uh, immediately um, to, to to recall now, but there was a um, a report by the Inspectorate uh, of, of Prosecution last year, um, possibly the year before now. 
in the last couple of years, there has been a report by the inspector that looked at um, the, uh, the caseload um, of COPFS in relation to sexual offending. Um, and uh, interestingly, in, in that report, it was identified, um, the kind of the categorisation of, of that work uh, was identified as being a trend Mm -hmm. rather than as a, as a peak or a blip. Um, uh, so it is something that, that um, we expect to continue. And that's, I think, the reason why the, the, sort of the internal structural changes have been made to the organisation and indeed the, you know, the business case to, to support some of that. Um, I'm, I'm sure colleagues from senior management could uh, elaborate in greater detail for you. But um, yes, it is something that... Uh, based on, on current information and the most recent assessment, we would expect to seek to continue. And is that a view shared by PCS? It's very difficult to, to, to envisage what, what can happen in the future, but I, I do have uh, f um, feedback from speaking to senior management who, they, their opinion is that, that this is, uh, as, as Fiona says, is a trend. It's, it's not going to be a, um, peaks and troughs. It's going to be something that's going to be steady work coming through, that, and that's why I think they've asked to address it in such a fashion. I would just also like to drill into the numbers. I mean, we're hearing loud and clear that, that the additional money is welcome, that the additional resource is welcome. But if you look at the, the budget for COPFS over the last uh, uh, few years, and you look at it in real terms, in 2014-15, in uh, the budget was 120 million in real terms in today's money, and it's essentially going back to, to 116. So, in, in, in real terms, that's four million pounds less. That's uh, just over three percent um, decline. Is that a concern? I mean, and to what extent are these additional resources, real additional resources, or just a restoration of the resource that was there back in 2014-15? In well, I think that there's a few things. Um, if I may, I would take you back even further than the 2014 uh, figures back to the 2009-2010 figures, um, because we, we analysed there that had our uh, budget kept pay pace with inflation um, today, or actually by 2017, which was the most recent inflation figures I could uh, <laughs> establish, um, it would have been 150 million. Um, uh, a, a difference of over 35 million and a real terms cut um, in the COPF, uh, COPFS budget of over 23%. Um, so in real terms, um, the, uh, the, the, when, when you consider both the inflationary pressures and also the fact that um, but now a far greater percentage of our overall budget is spent on staffing, mm -hmm. Um, the, 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 the pressure on the organisation um, has increased. Um, to be fair, when you talk about restoration of um, figures, we, we, we had some toing and froing with the department um, when we were sort of um, preparing our um, submission about whether this would simply restore our staffing figures to a to a previous high or whether it would take it to an all-time high. I'm, I'm told, I'm reassured that it will take it to an all-time high. Um, but as I say, the, the, um, the proportion of our budget um, in, in previous years that was spent on staffing was, I think, 59%. Um, and it's now approaching 70%. I think it was 67% or something. Um, at the amount of the budget that goes towards staff costs. I mean, just on that all-time high point specifically, is that an all-time high in headcount or FTE? Because I think it's always important to be very clear on that point. Um, I'm, I'm told, I'm, I'm, I'm reassured that it's, it's um, full-time equivalent. OK. Uh, and likewise, I'd be grateful for the PCS view. Yeah, on just like you want to say there, that, that um, re restoration in terms of the, the staff, uh, we've been given guarantees as well that the, it will be an all-time high and senior management have given us a very positive outlook about that. The point I would make is that um, when you talk about real terms and things like that, wages haven't kept up in the last 10 years, and that's something, that, again, uh, the PCS as a union are very much um, uh, concerned about the, uh, the wages for, for, for members, uh, and uh, that's something that we'll be pushing for in the, the months ahead. Mr Carroll? Yeah, it's just on, on the point about the need for real terms increases. I mean, certainly for SCTS, the inflationary pay costs alone are three to four million pound a year. And certainly PCS SCTS branch feel 
that there is a need for real terms increases in revenue budgets to account for rising costs, including inflation, as opposed to reductions to budget in real terms. SCTS, like all other justice partners, have long-term fixed costs. And as far as our information uh, is concerned, SCTS don't have any room for absorbing future inflationary or staff costs. So I think I'm just going back to the point I made earlier, that there's, from certainly an SCTS perspective and from justice partners' perspective, there certainly needs to be a, a real terms increase in costs, including those uh, uh, for staff salaries. I would also just add very quickly, if I can, although we're here talking about the uh, justice sector in terms of criminal business, SCTS does uh, have responsibility for tribunals and the office of the, the public guardian as well. The tribunals, I'm sure, as the justice sector uh, committee will know, is ever expanding at the moment, not only for uh, tribunals that are uh, responsible for Scotland in terms of devolved responsibilities, but the reserve tribunals to possibly come on stream in 2021 uh, as well. And in respect of the Office of the Public Guardian, we've seen recently uh, from the Mental Welfare Commission a report in September 18, which has seen an increase of 149% of powers of attorney registered between 2008 uh, nine and 2017-18. Um, sorry, that was guardianships. Sorry, guardianships. Uh, uh, there's been an increase of 149% between 2008-9 and 2017-18, and powers of attorney registered have uh, risen from 47,000 in 2012-13 to a projected 82,000 in 2017-18. That's an increase of 71%. And at the moment, the staff in Office of the Public Guardian have not seen an increase in staff there either. We're covering that with um, temporary staff, and we would like to see the, the funding for those staff to be converted into full-time staff as well. I think the, the point is well made where there Thank is you. an increase in workload because of trends, because of um, issues in society. That should be reflected. I wonder before we leave the staffing issue, if um, Ms Eda, you could um, tell me, have any of the COPF staff been seconded to the inspectorate? We heard in the past that that was quite uh, common for this to happen. If so, how many? Um, I, I don't know the numbers. Um, I, I don't know. It's, it's a couple of staff. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's done by sort of advert and application as opposed to um, a, a tap on the shoulder and a secondment. Mm -hmm. This is where you're going. Um, so when, when vacancies have arisen there, they've been advertised uh, and, and been available for COPFS staff to apply for. And would the, the pay skills be the same or higher than um, they would initially, or, well, and currently That's be getting? That's a very good question and one that I don't know the answer to. Well, we'd be delighted if you could find out and get back to us. Okay. Um, Liam Kerr. Just a couple of <clears throat> wrap-up questions from me. Um, just on that point you just made, Brian Carroll, uh, about the other tribunals having an increase in workload, I think I'm right in saying the Employment Tribunal, UK-wide statistics these will be, but you might have a, a, a more narrow uh, understanding of the Scottish picture, but I think there's been a 170% increase in claims filed in one year. Uh, and in any event, has there been any increase in staff as a result of what has been, one way or another, a very significant increase? Uh, employment tribunals have not actually been devolved uh, to the, the Scottish Government as yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we are expecting employment tribunals to come over in 2021. That's one of the reserved uh, tribunals that we're expecting that will possibly come over at that point, along with um, immigration and one or two others. Right, but the, so the funding. So actually, when, our, when we're talking about funding at the moment, we don't need to. Uh, well, in, ter in, in terms of the the tribunals, the Scottish courts and tribunals um, have responsibility for, for example, housing and property chamber is one where uh, at the moment we're expecting a, an expansion of of staff. Now that funding, in terms of that expansion, may already be taken care of because I think that uh, chamber has been um, made in terms of the, the very recent housing and uh, 
rent and landlord uh, legislation, which is moving from actions going through court to disputes being taken through a tribunal. But, for example, over the last few years, um, SCTS has taken on uh, the Scottish Land Court. We're due to take on the parking adjudicators in uh, 20, 2019. The reserve tribunals, in terms of employment, for example, I think there has been that increase in the employment tribunals because of the fees for employment tribunals being taken away. And that would be a, a concern for Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service about the funding of that when they eventually come, come over. And uh, just a, a final point, just to go back to a point you made earlier, Fiona Eady. Um, in terms of the recruitment uh, of fiscals and, and bringing people in rather than uh, having them move out, let's assume, uh, so as you, as you heard at the start, so I'm in private practice, I've been for 17 years, but not in, uh, in this area at all. Let's say I wanted to go the other way. Uh, presumably, I'd be looking at a base salary scale, but for the first two years, notwithstanding 17 years as a qualified lawyer, the first two years I'd be on this reduced salary for the accreditation scheme. Is that correct? That is correct. Right. Thank you. I wonder if I could ask the, the panel to comment on um, a submission that we received from the Miscarriage of Justice organisation Glasgow, where they say that currently COPFS is um, under-resourced, requires a different standard, and um, they, they, they welcome the um, additional funding, but they're deeply concerned about the lack of any similar proposal for criminal legal aid. And they're talking both generally and more specifically in the context of the duty solicitor scheme. Um, uh, and I know that there are currently nine bar associations who have not participated in that. Is this something that has impacted that you're aware of in, um, in, in your experience? I don't feel I'm well placed to answer questions on that, I'm afraid. It's that that, that would be that would be legal legal, uh, uh, legal matters, and uh, we deal with the admin side. So that, that, that I, I wouldn't have uh, sufficient knowledge to, to make a comment on that. All right. Okay. I suppose it was just to see if it disrupted um, any business, and I suppose there was a knock-on effect. But we can take it up with the relevant submission. And there was just two other things, and that was just in the um, the submission from PCS. Continuum backlog and maintenance needs to be tackled. Are we talking about maintenance of the uh, of the estate? Yeah, it's the SCTS uh, estate, and that's the, that's the uh, SCS, uh, SCTS estate alone. There's a continuing backlog maintenance of uh, 39 million pounds currently. Uh, and my, infor my, my information is that um, SCTS need to spend uh, at least £5 million a year on backlog maintenance to maintain that level alone. Mm -hmm. And what would be the implications if, if that isn't addressed? Well, the backlog maintenance will just keep going up and up and up. Uh -huh. And what that would mean is that uh, services for the public and indeed the accommodation for the staff uh, that are working in the, in the buildings would deteriorate over time. Mm -hmm. So could it get to a point where it was holding up business potentially? Possibly. Okay. And can I ask you about the retained fines income and the shortfall of one million? I, th this was uh, something um, we had picked up from uh, board, board reports, and I think it's because um, a lot of other direct measures uh, are being used rather than complaints being served uh, for people to come through court. Um, and the, I think in respect of the shortfall, one of the direct measures being used in favour of others was police warnings. So instead of fines being imposed, police warnings were being given. So and I think that's for lower level crime. Uh -huh. So is it a case of um, this was expected, a level was projected, and because there's been a change? I don't know that it was expected. And, a, a, and if SCTS are coming along to, to speak to that to the Justice Committee, they may be able to give more information um, on that. I think the trend uh, was expected to remain possibly constant, if not increase, that more fines uh, 
were going to be collected. What I would say on that, though, is that sheriff court fines collected are not uh, retained. They are remitted to the UK government, as far as I'm aware currently. It's only since the courts unified that uh, fines, for example, like JP court uh, fines and other fixed penalty fines, some of that income can be retained by SCTS. Yeah, in particular, I notice that you make the point in the submission that the PCS S uh, SCTS branch are of the view with the increase in funding of the COPF, there's bound to have an effect on the throughput of business um, and whether this would um, affect possible increases in business in terms of an increase in fines enforcement mark in the court? Yeah, I mean, it depends on how uh, the fiscals mark the, the cases for coming through, but what we were anticipating was that an increase in staff could have an effect on both the business going through the courts mm -hmm. as well as direct measures being used. Therefore, that would have an increase on uh, fines enforcement. Yeah. Uh, would it be possible to give some more information on the shortfall of one million? Just um, what... what um... I could certainly find that out and put that information in if you're, if you're wanting that, yes. That would be helpful. OK, thank you. Have we any further questions? No further questions. It only me, remains for me to thank the, the witnesses for a very good evidence session and to spend briefly to allow for a change of witnesses and a five-minute comfort break.
Our second panel on pre-budget scrutiny will focus on funding of the third sector organising uh, organisations operating within the justice sector, and I welcome Chris McCulley, Development Coordinator, Criminal Justice Voluntary Sector Forum. Yes, <laughs> and Ewan. Oh, I'm not sure how we pronounce that. McElreed. McElreed. Uh, case work team Miscarriages of Justice Organisations Scotland, Stuart Valentine, Chief Executive Relationship Scotland, Tom Halpine, Tom Halpine Chief Executive of um, SACRO. You're all very welcome. And thank, I thank you again for the, the written submissions. Um, they're tremendously helpful for the committee to be able to look at these in advance of the evidence session and pick out um, elements which we want to ask you in more detail about. We'll go straight to, to questions, starting with one from Rona. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, yes, can I ask you whether you think the current funding of third sector organisations helps support the development and continuity of good services? And given the huge um, scale of, of great service that the third sector provide, do you think you're receiving adequate support? And just anybody who wants to start. Um, I th good morning, Convener. Thank morning. you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today. Um, the first thing I would say is it, it's quite difficult to know what level of support there is actually available for the third sector out there in terms of, uh, at present, obviously the Scottish Government doesn't provide detailed breakdowns as standard of budget, so it's quite difficult to know what support goes out to the sector as a whole. Uh, I think we can sort of generalise that there's some sort of the bigger headline items that they've um, provided support for over the previous uh, last couple of years. Um, they've done quite a lot of support around about um, uh, funding individual organisations. So in 2017-18, uh, they um, provided three million pounds to seven different organisations. They've provided funding to the uh, National Mentoring P Public Social Partnerships, uh, which are run, uh, which are Shine, New Roots, amongst others, and um, uh, HMP Lomas. Um, they've also provided funding to the prison visitor centres, all of which are provided by um, voluntary sector uh, in partnership with um, Scottish Prison Service. Um, and there's also the work of the sort of third sector division of Scottish Government to, to support the, the voluntary sector that way. Um, but in terms of, of, of whether or not that supports enough, I, I think um, we're getting into the to, to the essence of, of, sort of the, the submissions about whether or not um, what, what the issues for the voluntary sector are at the minute. I think those issues are, are quite considerable. Um, if we look at funding cycles at the minute, um, we're tending to see um, them having a, a very considerable impact. If we're looking at local um, services and local supports, I think um, th there's a real issue at the minute of a, a loss of funding for voluntary sector services, particularly services provided by, um, by local authorities. Um, you've, you've seen in Social Work Scotland's submission that um, current restraints uh, by, by their admission is, is, is leading to a reduction in, in voluntary sector service provision. So I think um, while the Scottish Government is providing quite considerable support across a number of different uh, areas in the justice system, um, on, the, on the ground we're seeing considerable um, loss of services, I think. Ms. right? Yes, hi, good morning. Thank you also for the opportunity to uh, come speak to you this morning. I mean, a direct answer to the question from our perspective is that we are inadequately funded to the extent that our service is now under serious threat. Uh, we've been encouraged to see that there has been significant funding made available in the broader context of victim support, and we welcome that. We entirely welcome that. Really, our position is that we would like to see ourselves as being regarded as mainstream in that context, in that the individuals that we represent are most certainly victims, and yet we are almost entirely excluded from the mainstream funding that's available to other organisations. We are, as I say, significantly underfunded, and that is the one great issue that faces us just now. It's actually an existential threat to us, uh, and that is why I, I'm, in, I'm particularly pleased to be able to come and to talk to you about these things today. C can I ask how long your organisation has been, been going? We were founded in 2001, so 17 years and counting. Okay. Have you always struggled at that you know, funding level? Uh, we had funding which was more appropriate to its time earlier on in our life cycle. Um, we also were providing, at, as a start-up, a perhaps less sophisticated and less widespread service. But the demand for our service has now increased to the extent that, uh, I mean, the growth is significant. We're growing in terms of uh, client demand at a rate of perhaps 30% per year. 
and the funding has not grown uh, in any, in fact, it's, one could almost say in real terms, it has diminished over the time, so that we are facing increasing pressure just to provide the service that we have hitherto been providing. Okay. Okay. Mr. Valentin? Yes, happy to come in. And I think for across the voluntary sector, the third sector, the issue of core funding uh, is, is very key. Now, my own organisation, Relationship Scotland, we do get money through the CORA Foundation and um, through the Children, uh, Young People and Families Early Intervention Fund. Um, many other sources of funding of the scale of, that would be required for our network is very hard to find. So you have the big funders, obviously the Scottish Government, the big lottery. Uh, beyond that, it's very difficult to see what funders are out there that can provide funding on the level that organisations like ours need. One very live issue for us is that the big lottery currently uh, give Relationship Scotland Network 750,000 a year for our child contact centres. That will run out over the next 18 months. Uh, and it's unclear, certainly the big lottery are saying they won't be able to continue to provide that level of funding. Um, and in terms of where else to go, there's very few places to go. Clearly, to the Scottish Government is one route, um, but there's not a lot of options for funding of that level. Uh, and in particular, um, for the voluntary sector as a whole, as I mentioned, the, the core funding issue, many funders want to provide smaller amounts for new innovative projects, um, but across the whole sector, there's vital services that need to continue on an ongoing basis and will be needed for many years to come. Um, I, and that core funding needs to keep coming through or else you know the kind of foundations that these organizations are built on wouldn't be able to continue okay. yeah. and mr thank you very much um i, I my uh, experience would reflect what i'm hearing from colleagues today and i, I think it would be uh, realistic to say that the, the overall funding picture is, is impacted by the availability of money in the system. So we understand that that is a contracting area in, in, in different areas. And the Scottish Government has been consistent with some support to my own organisation with core funding through grant every year. So that has stuck with that, and that, that's been very welcome. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the features of this, which you might want to reflect on, is you, you then have inconsistency across the country because when you have, you have 32 authorities making their own local decisions and yeah. some prefer in-house and out-house uh, outsource. Um, you, you then have uh, funding decisions be, being made at that level, which can be quite catastrophic for services where the most most impact of it at the local level. So it's maybe about how do we how do we raise that conversation up to what do we do with the resources available across the whole system and ensure that the third sector voices heard in those discussions because the, the biggest uh, um, concern I would have is that you're told about the decision way way after it's been made and you've not had a chance to have a part of well, what would the what would savings look like how what would this different type of service look like it's come back no we've made this decision and sorry that's it thank you Lee MacArthur supplementary on this one um, yeah. was I, it you and Dimson right yes no it not wasn't a supplementary in that. No, okay. not on this one. No. Move on to Fulton. Yeah, thanks, um, uh, convener. I, I was actually just, it goes on nicely from Tom Halpin's point there. Um, I know that most of the submissions have welcomed the Scottish Government um, uh, funding and initiatives in community justice, but how do we think, how do the panel think we can better utilise third sector organisations along with statutory resources? I suppose as I give you the, the, the links right back, I mean, it is about being seen as a, an equal partner and not something that's not, not statutory. And you have to be very careful what conversations you have because of unfair advantage, all that sort of thing. Now, the, 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 the great experience, the bits of the public social partnership and the change fund that clearly didn't play out as it was intended in terms of sustained funding. And, but what really everybody involved it said really worked was that the, the initial co-design stage and the coming together with a solution. Now, if you just look at that, that one uh, experience, and I'm not talking about just one public social partnership, a, a number of them were able to uh, tackle gender inequality across Scotland, across all of Scotland, in a very quick period of time, and get it up and running. Now, that, that, 
that was where the, the, the third sector were able to come to the table with partners and local authorities for a very effective solution very, very quickly. So it's, it's, it's more about the involvement in the conversation and in the co-design. I think partnership is very key, uh, not duplicating, having different organisations providing roughly the same thing. I think making it more focused is very helpful. Uh, and also following on from the recommendations of the Christie Commission, having services integrated as much as possible. Um, I can speak most closely, of course, with the work of Relationship Scotland. We were formed through a merger between Relate uh, Scotland and Family Mediation back in 2008. And what we're now able to do is provide a whole range of family support services um, from the one hub, uh, different hubs sorry, across the, the country, but integrated at the local level as well. And I think that results in certainly cost savings, a clearer route through for clients uh, and overall a more efficient service. Okay. Um, I would just add to, to the comments already that obviously that sort of process of, of allocating funding, deciding what resources are, are, are targeted where and, and sort of commissioning process um, and the, the involvement of the voluntary sector in that process is, is really vital to understanding, first of all, need of people going through the justice system and then secondly about actually about what is practical to deliver. Um, so I think picking up on Tom's point, that sort of inclusion and collaborative approach to service design and development is, is fundamental. But there's a, there's a, there's a question about um, the support available for the voluntary sector locally and the voluntary sector nationally, because to be able to engage in processes, to be able to allocate the time and the resources to developing a, a new service or a, um, a, a, a particular programme, um, you need to be able to dedicate staff time and resources. I mean, we're talking in sort of commissioning activities, really, really considerable amounts of time having to go into um, writing bids to, to developing um, services to all this um, um, sort of merry-go-round of services that then the funding cycle means that you're having to do it every single year. You've got a considerable period at the start of the year ramping up and ratcheting up your services and at the end of the year you've got a considerable period of time potentially winding them down only to be told at the last minute that actually your funding has been confirmed. I think it's, it's fairly standard practice for voluntary sector providers to have to issue redundancy notices come February every year. Um, because they haven't got their, their, their funding confirmed until um, and then have to retract those, um, those notices later on you know, by, by the time they get to March. Um, and ultimately that has a, a significant impact on people's lives, not just staff members, but also has a uh, significant impact on the people using the services because uh, many services, particularly say something like addiction services uh, that have a basis in that, it would be wholly unconscionable to accept someone onto a service and to start them on a, a, a period of support to then have to retract that because your funding ceases to exist as of the 1st of April. So I think there's one way that we can get the most out of the third sector is making sure that those funding cycles uh, actually work effectively and there's not this tremendous amount of, of, of wastage that goes on. And I think that's something that um, certainly the Scottish Government is, is um, can, can lead from the front on, make sure that they don't replicate the sort of the mistakes that are possible. Okay, thank you. And yes, Mr. Yes, I, I just I'd like to associate myself with Mr. McCulley's re remarks there in relation to the funding cycle. In the particular nature of the work that we do, every new client we take on is, by definition, a long-term commitment. You're looking at a period from perhaps a minimum of five years to a lifelong commitment, and the absence of a commitment to the funding we require to do that creates exactly the problems that Mr. McCulley was talking about. In terms of integration of our service with others. Um, I'm not trying to claim any uniqueness of status here. I think perhaps our service is perhaps a little different from the other services being examined just now, but we do, insofar as possible, dovetail with the public, publicly provided service in that we seek to bring our clients to that service. These are clients who are, by their very nature, distrustful of any agency of the state, and a large part of what we do is to support and the system simply into integrating with services which are available. The difficulty for us arises where the very specialist services that our particular clients require do not exist. That, I suspect, is, is however, more an issue um, for healthcare provision than justice, so perhaps I should leave it at that. Okay. So, can I, can yes. I, so um, no, thanks, thanks very much for those answers. And I think I did uh, go some way to say the, the, the sort of national scheme, and there was also some discussion about uh, happening at local authority level as well. I suppose I, want, I wanted to um, sort of ask for where it's appropriate for your organisation. 
about how you can maybe impact on at, at the very um, individual level, if you like. So if you, there's a lot of talk about the community payback orders that are being used and um, on an individual basis that community payback orders can bring in a variety of services. Um, and I know that that might be quite specific, but I'm even, I'm even thinking in terms of some of the funding that has uh, recently been announced for um, female offending, for example, and it's been set up in uh, several local authority areas over the over the country. Is, is this a, an opportunity to get involved in that for your organisations and other third sector, um, or do you see it as a, a further challenge? Who'd like to? Yes, Mr. Rahn. <clears throat> so, so that question directly impacts in the work of my own organisation, so we have uh, the, the uh, experience of it. Um, we supervise unpaid work in the City of Glasgow, we have done it in other local authority areas, and we, we, we along with other third sector organisations, uh, provide s support to other activities, uh, that, uh, other bits of the order. The, the <coughs> the benefit of the, the, the third sector involvement in some way in this is the added value that it brings to the table beyond the statutory requirement. And, and without, now, there's huge innovation in uh, local authorities' work in delivering unpaid work. This is uh, in no way diminishing from that and no way replacing that. But, but small things like um, in the, 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 the third sector creativity, not having the statutory controls in some ways and in other areas, can bring other players to the table. You know, and stuff like you know, you, you see examples like groundworks and improving the, the physical location, etc. But even having those contacts of bringing further education colleges to the table with uh, access uh, activities and stuff like that, it's that creative thinking beyond the demand that you've got every day just adds value, and, and, and that's not always just got a pound sign. It actually can be that's joining up dots. So it, it comes back to my fundamental theme of, of, of not being afraid to involve this broad sector in these conversations, etc. Because there, there, there was, um, I, 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 I wrote a piece in this was about power to the people. You know, it, it, it's very, very. Uh, Important that no one body at the table holds all the power here. You know, if you're a citizen that really needs help, you want to be really in control of yourself and your own destiny and where it's going. Now, if you come to that table in the conversation of, I've got the statutory authority, and you you are coming as a third sector and, and, and you're not the statutory authority, whether it's intended or, or unintended, there is a consequence in that dynamic. And what we, as, as a Scotland is going to build the Scotland that we all want. It's got to be something where we're all equal in this. And that actually, so this fundamental bit of involving the third sector in the conversation is really quite deep to the design of the services that we all want in Scotland. Anyone else? Yes, Mr. McCann. I, I think to pick up on, on to what Tom said as well about sort of potential unique role that the, that the third sector can play in, in working with individuals. I mean, there's, there's quite a bit of research, um, or certainly an, an emerging body of research about sort of distinctive role that the voluntary sector can play in relation to, to working with people in the justice system. And the first thing you find is, is that you, you've got a relationship that isn't characterised by coercive control. It's not the same way that, uh, say, a, a prison officer or a, a social worker might have a, a right to, or an ability to breach or to, you know, to, to determine sort of uh, additional punishment for an individual. So that sets up a very different relationship in terms of um, services. Um, it also then means that you can build personal relationships in a way that um, you can't perhaps necessarily do with, with other um, services. And it allows um, one uh, piece of research by Dr. Philippa Tomzak at the University of Sheffield so that um, the voluntary sector is particularly good at allowing people to build social capital through bringing those things, like Tom said, those additional resources into the table <laughs> um, to, to actually allow a, a sort of more holistic look at support for individuals. So I, I think um, in terms of whether or not these things are, are, are opportunities, I think absolutely. I think the third sector could be um, front and centre. We've got, we've got the relationship, we've got the, the skills sort of, as well. I mean, most, uh, I'm sure most uh, my colleagues at the table would agree in terms of Actual, the actual services, most services have, a, have to report to very high standard in terms of demonstrating their effectiveness. And that's usually done through an outcomes focus. So that, that, that sort of proven um, success, I think as well, means that this is definitely an opportunity for the third sector. Okay, Mr. Mahalkin. Mr. Halpin, yeah. Uh, just to uh, complete my, my, my reflection on that one, 
that it's an ugly truth in, in, in recent times with the additional monies that have come in, etc., with pressure everyone's on, where we would have previously seen a flow of a portion of that coming naturally to the third sector. It does at the moment appear to be uh, the, the first reaction is we do it in-house and, and, and we, you know, because of all the pressures we've got, and making use of the teams that we've got, and whether it's intended or not intended, the third sector is increasingly not involved in those new initiatives at the moment. And Ms. Merkel Wright. <laughs> if I could just speak again from our own experience, I think the particular service that we provide is one that can effectively only be provided through the third sector, simply because of the nature of the problem. Um, our overarching function is to seek at least to reintegrate damaged people back into society. And the problem that we have is that the people we're seeking to reintegrate have a well-founded mistrust of almost everything that is society, certainly all the institutions and agencies of the state. And, and I think that the trust that is absolutely critical to the work that we do can really only be engendered in a uh, voluntary organisation uh, situation rather than uh, you know, attempting to, to, to develop that through an agency of the state. And in that sense, I, I agree with what my colleagues at the table have said. OK. Anyone else? So, yeah, yes, just uh, very briefly, just to say that our, our work, uh, Relationship with Scotland, we work very closely with the courts. So, for example, in our child contact centres, 80% of the referrals to our child contact centres come directly from the courts or from solicitors. Um, and I think there's a, a key role in terms of the way we can work with the people who come to us. Many are extremely vulnerable. They have a whole range of different issues that you, you may uh, expect. Um, and our ability to work very closely with them over a, an extended period, uh, I think, is a real strength of uh, the voluntary sector. And uh, I think that strongly complements the work in that the, the courts are trying to do around all of the issues of child contact. Uh, two supplementary, Shona and Daniel. It's really just to, to build on what's, what's been said. Um, I think you've all recognised that um, funding is, is a challenge that it's impossible maybe to fund everything everywhere therefore maybe a different approach needs to be taken to how you work together with each other as third sector organisations and then how you interact with statutory services. Tom Halpin mentioned an example earlier on which sounded a very positive one around effective um, partnership. It would be helpful either at the moment or following up from the session if you would be able to furnish us with other examples of where you have proactively collaborated as third sector organisations um, and whether or not in your future plans you have those for the next year, couple of years. Because I do think um, it, it, it is about not just avoiding duplication, but it's also about building, playing to your strengths. So it would be helpful either now or as a follow up to get that. Uh, I don't need to apologise. I um, can follow up, happy to do that, but there is there is huge amounts of examples. Shine, I mentioned, is a collaboration mm -hmm. of eight organisations. In the City of Edinburgh here, we have a collaboration of Bright Choices of across four organisations with uh, six women uh, from BME communities who speak 20 languages support and survivors of FGM. Uh, those, are, those are real collaborations that are on the ground and across, across that. The, the thing that um, is increasingly difficult at the moment in bringing collaborations together, because while money is contracting uh, not just across local authorities spend, it's also contracting across independent funders being available. We've heard about threats from uh, the future uh, or, or the feeling of uh, at risk for projects that are like big lottery funding, etc. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think the funding issue in terms of collaboration, that, but when you go beyond a specific intervention, and collaboration around an intervention is actually quite, is one of the easier ones. It's when you collaborate in broader things around resource, around back office functions and mm -hmm. things like that. And I think that government and third sector division and, and others, as well as the third sector have a role to play in how do we actually support organisations understand that better. Mm -hmm. So collaboration is broader than just the, the service we deliver. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, Daniel. Uh, Tom, you, you brought to life, I think, quite strongly how uh, the third sector is, is quite 
critical or certainly really mm -hmm. adds value in terms of community uh, justice orders. Um, we also hear quite regularly at this committee that, that one of the things that holds them back is, is just simply kind of uh, judges and sheriffs' understanding of what's available to them. And so therefore, to what degree is the instability of funding actually holding back the, 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 the use of uh, community justice orders and, in, and, and, and furthermore, kind of their, their, their effectiveness because of a, of a lack of funding? It's a very good question. And I, I hear about this reluctance, uh, perceived reluctance of sentencers to engage. My experience of it is if it's a, a credible and consistently available intervention, sentencers have no difficulty with it. It's, it's when it's not credible or it's not, it's not always there, then they lose faith in that. And the other thing uh, in, in terms of this um, is that we, we need to always go back to what is our actual strategy and what, is, what are the aims of Scotland's justice strategy. And, and you know, things like the preventative spend, which is a low-hanging fruit. Yeah. And if you ask organisations like me, we, we are really under pressure now in terms of those types of services. Just not even, you know, it might be said it's good in-house, but we know ourselves it's, it's, it's withdrawing from it. And, you know, you, you look like issues which government, in, in fairness, are looking seriously at just now, but it can't be governed, the Scottish government on its own, it needs local authorities, so things like um, bail supervision, mm. remand is going back up, you know, yeah. it, we very recently have had 400 women in Scotland's yes. prisons again, yet that's the areas where we've suffered the, the biggest funding cuts, bail supervision. So the strategy and the decisions around that actually are not joining up. So those are the areas that I would welcome more scrutiny of. You, you make a good point and timely, given that we've got a debate on remand uh, tomorrow. Can I ask one final cheeky question in this session, which is if um, community justice services receive £35 million a year, but the Scottish Prison Service receives £361 million a year, is that the right balance? And if it's not, what should that balance look like? And I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in anyone's response to that. I, I don't believe it's the right balance. It's a balance that you're trapped into at the moment because you have to make some really brave and decisive uh, changes for it to, to, to be able to move. But um, if, you look, if you look at other Scandinavian countries and the prison population and, 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 and things like that, th it can be made. Be, you know, people fear that you will have a, a crime wave, that it will be more unsafe, etc. Well, look at what's happened with the, the great story around youth justice in Scotland. We took, took young adults out of the court system and, and actually youth offending uh, reduced. Uh, that was in Aberdeen uh, with the whole systems approach at that time. Um, so it, it's about building confidence around this, but it, won't, it will not shift that balance unless you make decisive change. You, you mentioned remand, and as Daniel said, we have a debate on that tomorrow. Part of our report was looking at the, the resources for um, through care after someone leaves remand, uh, also for the opportunity to have some meaningful activity while people are on remand, and the point was made that that would need to be resourced. Do you have a, a view on that and how, how we could... Well, does that need to go into the, the legislation? I suppose my next point is there might be resources for it, but if it isn't given directly to the voluntary sector and it goes through the local authority, there is sometimes competition. They decided to, to do it in the house. So how can you make your case? They'll be good at some things. You may excel at others. How do you make the case for you being able to get that, um, that funding? Um, the reason we had the Angelina Commission was the, both the gender inequality, but also geographical inequality of service availability, particularly in voluntary through care, which was always a, an obligation on local authorities. And, and, and remand is, is really a, an extension of that, in my view. When we um, designed the SHINE partnership, the, there was a huge discussion, do you include remand? There was the, people, the, the group that said, well, you keep them out, they're too difficult, etc. I'll tell you, we've stuck with it. We've stuck with it for five years. Um, 76% of women eligible for SHINE in Scotland's prison system voluntarily engage. <coughs> and of that, 76% could, 
come to a, a planned exit. So it's, it's, we, we know it's there. And we've included remand in this. So the idea that you cannot work with remand, remand are difficult to work with. And it's a challenge for everyone because the uncertainty the people themselves are facing, etc. But we, we know that through care and remand can, can be looked at as more holistically. And the thing about through care is if you only focus on the through care, you're talking about after the event. If you focus on the remand, you're getting ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. And yet that's where we're cutting the money. Yeah. So it's an earlier intervention, which brings me, I think, to the other thing you mentioned, that was electronic monitoring, um, where we're, we're looking maybe to extend um, bail provisions by more electronic monitoring. When the committee visited the WISE group, it was laid absolutely on the line to us that if this is to succeed, there must be resources put into this, and the voluntary sector are going to play a huge part in that. So I wonder if the, the panel could comment on that particular aspect. Uh, Tom? I, I, I don't want to hog about that. This is uh, probably relevant here. If, if you have a technical solution to controlling people without the other support, you're going to increase in your breaches, and your, actually your amount population is going to go up. Yeah. Uh, Liam, Liam. Liam MacArthur, yes, supplementary. Yeah, yeah, just an extension of that. I mean, the, the convener pointed to the um, proposals around electronic monitoring. We've also got um, a, a sort of direction in travel in terms of extending the presumption against shorter sentences to out to 12 months. And what you've already described, all of you, is a, a funding landscape that is challenging, um, a funding landscape for statutory providers that maybe puts an additional squeeze on, on third sector organisations as well as um, some uncertainty around the, the budget cycles, um, which compounds those, those, those other issues. I mean, to what extent, uh, in terms of the engagement that you have with Scottish Government about the development of, of policy and proposed changes in, in, in policy, where you say, look, in, unless you provide some certainty around this funding, then you cannot deliver the, the, the policy intention, which in these instances, I think most of us would would agree is is the right way to be to be going. Um, and and to what extent, if you're make, if you're giving that message, do you feel that that message is being um, heard and 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 acted upon? Who'd like to take that? Yes, you and that. Well, we have in fact made that very point. Uh, we have been supported by. Modest, we're grateful for it. Please don't misinterpret. We have made the point, however, that the funding that we have is at a level which, as I said earlier, constitutes an existential threat. We are following a, and we have developed a model in close consultation with the Scottish Government. We have met the targets that they've asked for us, sorry, asked of us. Uh, as I say, we have made the point in quite stark terms, this needs to change or we simply have to stop. Um, we await a response to that at this, at this stage. Yes, Mr uh, Stewart. Uh, just as a general point, I guess, about if, if there are services that the Scottish Government would like the voluntary sector to deliver across the country, there's the issue about how that happens. Uh, we are fortunate that our core grant from the Cora Foundation goes to both our national office and every one of our services across the country. That's quite rare in the voluntary sector. Many other agencies will find funding more straightforward to get in some parts of the countries and not others. Uh, and if there are services that the, the government and others would like to be delivered across the whole of the country, often there may need to be a, a different approach taken to how they are funded. If it's solely left to the local authorities to decide in their particular area, there's many strengths of that approach, but it may result, result in the fact that some services will be available in some areas of the country, but not in others. Thank you for that. I think that's a point well made. John, supplementary. I think, uh, Mr McCulley's wanting to make a point. Oh, sorry. Missed you. <laughs> um, I was just going to say I would, I, would, um, I, would, I would echo all of those comments. Um, in terms of the, the, the necessity of support for actually this, these changes, whether it's uh, presumption against short-term sentences, EM, or um, supported bail, it's, it's one that we make regularly, and it's one that we... Um, we make through consultation responses and it's one that we make uh, through sessions with Scottish Government. I think in that sense there has at times been very good um, opportunities for discussion with Scottish Government but as to how often it's taken on board I think um, given that previous Cabinet Secretary reinforced that there would be no new money made available to, to support things and shows that quite obviously it wasn't taken on board. 
I should probably declare an interest as um, my wife is a mediator with Re Relationship Scotland, Orkney, so I wouldn't like to <laughs> think that it, I'm, I'm making a bid on her behalf. I mean, just in, in relation to that final point from, from Mr McCulley, that, I mean, that, the concern would be that then the, the, the policy is published, the proposals come forward in, in legislation with a, with a financial memorandum um, a, a, attached to them, but, but actually a level of uncertainty about the, the deliverability which should be a concern to, to all of us, because we can sign up to the, the, the policy objectives, but if the funding isn't there to, to support that change, um, then the, the, the consequences are, are going to be fairly, fairly severe in an area as sensitive as, as criminal justice inevitably is. I, I, I think so. I think um, when, you, when you tinker with a system, and you, you change a little bit of it, it can have massive impacts all the way across. Um, if we look at sort of what's happened with the Community Justice Scotland Act, I think it's got very um, laudable policy aims about making um, justice locally focused and about um, bringing a range of, of statutory and non-statutory and third sector partners around the table together to, to solve a problem. Um, but if the mechanisms for funding that and the mechanisms for uh, deciding what happens within those local arrangements aren't supported and aren't funded and aren't put in place, you end up with a situation where it's, it's the third sector that drops off the table first. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the optional extras that make a big difference that drop off the table first. And what you end up with is the, the sort of uh, statutory bare minimum that gets funded, which, don't get me wrong, I don't, I don't want to be misrepresented here, does fantastic work. But if we're talking about um, that sort of unique contribution of the voluntary sector to actually improve people's lives and to help contribute towards reduction in reoffending, I think we need to make sure that that doesn't drop off. I think the worry is that at the minute, with the sort of move to the, to the new model of community justice, and particularly with changes to the Section 27 funding for community justice, which has resulted in the removal of the distinction of, of core and non-core funding, and uh, non-core funding historically had gone to, to fund voluntary sector services. Um, I think with things like that, we, we could be sort of sleepwalking into a bit of a situation that, that ends up with a massively reduced capacity in the third sector, and it could happen overnight. I think if you look at the the transforming rehabilitation changes in England and Wales. Um, I'm not suggesting it's anywhere near as drastic as that, but I'm sure the committee will be aware that was um, a horrendous mistake and has resulted in massive loss of, of provision and, and, and um, the whole scheme has had to be uh, brought forward and scrapped well in advance of when it was intended to do so. I think if you change these things and you don't actually take account of what's happening, you, you can end up drifting into a very dangerous situation. John, your supplementary. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I, forgive me, because I might struggle to try and put this together. M Mr Halpern, I think in previous occasions we, we, we've talked about a role that your organisation placed in turning around bail supervision in a, a, a number of local authority areas. Now, we're scrutinising public money here, and of course we've got the Scottish Government uh, budget. Um, there's the role for community justice, there's the role for local authorities. I suppose I'm asking you, is this committee capable of audit trailing that level of scrutiny, because the, the convener talked about uh, electronic monitoring. No one wants to intrude in the decisions of local authorities to make their own decisions about taking things in-house, but uh, who scrutinises that then, the effectiveness? Let's stick with that issue where it was a commendable turnaround of figures on the back and then these, it was taken in-house. Who should scrutinise that, if not this committee? And can we scrutinise it? So there's a couple of bits. I think the proper role for scrutiny that is the local council. You know, and, and officials there should have to. If you're making a significant change to a service on the ground in a local authority, that should be a report to the relevant committee of that local authority. So for for good reasons, not just challenge, but actually so that we we, we understand the, the the services that we're delivering. Could you do it in every, every committee and every local authority? I think that answers itself. But I do think that this is an area where, in terms of this committee, it's about scrutinising the strategy, the, the, the Scotland's justice strategy, and how that's going forward, and getting updates on that through Audit Scotland or whatever. It, you know, so that it's at that level it, that, that those decisions have been made at a local level. Do they follow the strategy? Is, is it what we're intending to do? Or are they just, I've got a local, I've got such a local issue, a local wish that I'm going to go over this way. Um, well, it might be justified, it might not, but at least it should be scrutinised at that local level. And if I may, then, does that suggest a, a, some sort of oversight from what the 
criminal justice collectively? But, but I, I, I do. Um, I'm, I'm, you've clearly got me thinking in my feet about what does that well, look if, like. If I mean, I'm conscious that on, on the, the particular example you shared with the committee previously, I think it wasn't just uh -huh. a single local authority. No, no, it's, it's a number of local authorities no. working together. Yes. So the, if it's three or four, there's three, three yes. reports, four uh -huh. reports the committee. And I mean, we want to understand that the money's been best expended, and you know, yes. results are often a way of doing that. Well, we have a structure with uh, the, the new community justice arrangements with. Uh, community justice uh, outcome improvement plans at local levels and maybe changes of that nature should be reported in annually within the lines you would expect an improvement plan to report back and that should be analysed. My fear is we've seen over the years these plans are all gathered and come in and, but how much depth is there as analysis over that to decide what, what's the plans for next year. It might be scrutinised locally but does it look at it in the aggregated form? No, that's Community Justice Scotland's uh, hope of them. Chris? Just going to, to, to make the point that Community Justice Scotland has responsibility for gathering all the annual reports from each of the Community Justice Partnerships, which should, in theory, uh, state uh, their sort of progress against outcomes at a local level. So in that sense, Community Justice Scotland will be doing a bit of work, I believe, over the next year. Or no, I think, I'm not quite sure of their timescales, but it's published in their, in their work plan, um, which set out sort of they're reporting on those progress against outcomes across the country. So I think that could be something the committee could look into. Good idea. Sorry, John, no, no, you finished. No, I think. Right, carry on. Yeah. No, I was going to say, it, it just seems a long way from here, if you, if you like, and, and no one wants to tread on the territory of, 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 of local authorities. But clearly, you know, at some point, we'll have the Cabinet Secretary for Justice in here holding them to account. We've got this other legislation on the way. I mean, I hate to use the phrase cluttered landscape, but, you know, I'm because all of us here are more interested in, in a situation where figures are turned around because of positive intervention, whoever does that. No, and I think the, um, the, the difficulties in knowing what's going on at any one part of the justice system at any one time is, is quite, quite considerable, but um, certainly I think that's somewhere where the Community Justice Scotland, as they continue to develop, I think we'll, we'll be able to perhaps provide a little bit of clarity. But I think, um, well, I would, I would definitely echo Tom's point about and your point about not wanting to be sort of too, too micro level and, and, and getting in amongst local authority decisions. I think there is definitely a role for both the Scottish Government and for, your, for yourselves to, to take a, an overview of the system, because I think uh, if we can establish what trends are happening in terms of funding allocation, that can go a long way to seeing whether or not that's the direction we want it to be. And I think that the problem at the minute is that we don't really know what, what money is going where, necessarily. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. That was certainly a concern when we set up Community Justice Scotland. That would be the overriding um, thing. We, we would, we're concerned they may dictate to local partnerships. Because they are based in 32 local authorities, now I think the question seems to be there's the flexibility there. But the question is, where is the funding going? And um, I think we possibly need a mechanism to look at it being spent in the very best way possible because it's based on local authorities. Perhaps there's a, a tendency to, to look to the local authority first to provide the service. So definitely I think there's analysis needed there um, to make sure that the third sector aren't excluded from these non-statutory um, type activities, which as you said, um, Tom, can make such a, a difference to preventing um, the escalation of, um, of crime and, and um, bad outcomes. <laughs> Liam, I think you've got a very pertinent question. Me? Yes. Ah, yes, I have. <laughs> I wasn't sure, yeah. <laughs> this better be good. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to start with a statement in the interest of complete transparency, which is that uh, I was a non-executive director of Family Mediation Grampian uh, at, uh, several years ago, which, as you've heard, is now part of Relationships Scotland. Um, it, just in terms of long-term funding, we, we've explored funding uh, at some length. Uh, in terms of the longer, t or the fact that it seems to be short-term at the moment, uh, and Tom Halpin, in your submission, you talk about it would be ideal to have a five to ten year funding cycle. Uh, how realistic is that? Or is, is that somewhere we could actually get to, both in terms of government funding, but also in terms of, say, big lottery funding? Are we ever actually going to get to the ideal? That there are some, it's different in different types of services. You know, that there'll be 
the initiative, you want to try something out, etc. So clearly, you understand what you're involved in there. But if you look at a, a major change fund success, like the Wise Group's leading news routes or Cycles leading Shine, um, you, you, it's such a significant change that you, you have to invest in that. So why, why was it in every single year there, we lost really good staff December, January, because they're a young person starting a family, want a mortgage, and there's no certainty of funding. And an organisation like mine, who has built up some reserves that we can, t t t we, we can take the risk of, there's no issuing notices. But a, a, another partner in the same relationship says, well, I don't have those reserves. I need to tell people they're at risk. I can't carry that. And, and, and I'm having to negotiate within the partnership. Now, so I do believe in, 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 in that example, the government could have invested for five years and, get, and, and allow us to, because we did design IT systems around this, but to integrate outcomes, uh, evaluation methodologies, and risk assessments, that was never going to happen in six months or a year. So I do think there are, there are bits there that, that we, we shy away from it, saying, well, that's the budgetary system of the Scottish government or the Scottish parliament. And, and of course, at the other end of that, I've got some uh, very vulnerable hard-working young people starting off in their life with no certainty. Uh, that's just not acceptable. And then you get in between that, that, that three-year contracts are, are well, just that's the, the reality. But what we are doing at the moment is we are constantly managing change in the workforce. Stuart Valentine. Just, just to add, I, mean, I think in terms of Scottish Government funding, um, three years funding with known amounts would be an incredible step forward, certainly for our network. And we were awarded three years funding from the Cora Foundation's fund that I mentioned previously, uh, although you weren't told what you would get in the future years until about three months before uh, that money would kick in. So you were given a three-year award, but there was no certainty for what years two and three would be and you don't find that out until about, as I say, just at the turn of the year. Um, the Big Lottery uh, have been one of the few funders that would give five years funding, and that certainly is extremely helpful uh, for those services who have been fortunate enough to get it. One additional point I think is worth mentioning is for those uh, agencies who do get long-term core funding, who, who have had it year on year, often there will be no cost of living increase. So certainly with our, within our network, there has been no cost of living increase for the past 15 years which means year on year, effectively, it's resulting in a reduction in funding, which, of course, you just have to manage. Um, but the whole issue of, you know, of cost of living increase to funding, especially from the Scottish Government, is certainly a key one for the voluntary sector. Okay. Patiently, and then I'll come to you. Um, just, um, I should probably have I declared beforehand that we do receive some money from the Scottish Government, so in that sense, I'm perhaps not entirely impartial. But um, the... The question of how, how long term can we can we be, if we if we look at um, you know we, we, we understand the realities of um, yearly parliamentary budgets and about how you know there's, there's a limitation to that and perhaps uh, sort of on the, at the very far end of the spectrum it's not, not perhaps reasonable to be um, sort of 20 years down the line, but at the risk of sounding slightly petulant and maybe facetious, if we were to look at private company contracts through the justice system, for example, to provide prison services, to provide electronic monitoring services, I don't think G4S or Circo are going to be on a one-year rolling contract that changes every year. So obviously there is scope within the system for flexibility, and I think I would encourage that flexibility wherever we can find it. Good point. Ewan. Just on the question of 10-year funding, and I have no idea how we would achieve that, but for our purposes as an organisation, even an extension from two-year to three-year funding would hugely enhance our ability to make commitments of the type that we're required to make. I'll give you an example. Our lease is due for renewal. Now, on a two-year funding cycle, we have to take a year-on-year -year lease, which is significantly more expensive for the same property as against taking it on, say, a six-year term but with a three-year break clause. So that one year of increase in the cycle would be of very significant assistance to us. As regards the... And I hear what my colleagues here say, and I, I, I recognise and sympathise with it. We don't have the problem of having to worry about laying off staff, laying off staff because virtually all of our staff are volunteers. We can only afford to pay two salaries in our organisation out of a total staff of just in excess of 20. Uh, and it is a matter of great concern to me personally that of the two salaried staff, they are, um, they are working now and have been for some time at a figure markedly less than the living wage. 
So uh, that has to change for our purposes. It's not just that it's unfair, it is frankly unsustainable. I'm sorry I keep making that point, but that really is the central point that I want to get across here. If I might stick with you, Mr McElvride, uh, on funding, uh, but on a slightly different point. In your submission, you talked about legal aid yeah. uh, and being underfunded. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to develop that. What do you specifically mean by legal aid being underfunded? And as part of that, you suggest that experienced solicitors are deserting this sort of work. Do you have evidence for that? And do you have any evidence that suggests that that has increased since there were some regulation changes in January? We move and shake, as it were, in the legal profession. We have significant anecdotal evidence to that effect. Um, I suspect that the type of written evidence I can provide for you would not be entirely satisfactory in the sense that it, it is in the form of, for instance, postings on our Facebook page. But I speak daily to solicitors. Solicitors refer us inquiries because they want to help the client, but they're not being funded to do it. And this is one of the real reasons why we are finding such a significant increase in our workload, particularly over the last couple of years. The, uh, the word that I hear from the solicitors that I speak to is that they simply cannot afford to continue legal aid work. You go into the Summary Cause Court, Glasgow Sheriff Court, you'll see the people doing the legal aid work tend to be more seasoned gentlemen and ladies because younger solicitors are not moving into that branch because there's no money in it for them. And I think that perhaps the most stark illustration of that that I've come across in the last month or so is the announcement by the Law Society of Scotland that in order to overcome the shortage of new entrants to legal aid work, they are proposing to have first-year trainee solicitors authorised to appear in court. Now, when you put that against the other side of that equation, where the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service are being handsomely funded to properly train a number of more prosecutors, where does that leave your equality of arms? There is a serious problem here. I can't really... Um, stand it up, if you like, other than by, by, by anecdotal evidence, but there is so much of that, and I see it washing through into our increased workload that I'm in no doubt at all that the legal aid system is in crisis. Thank you. I could ask specifically about the duty solicitor scheme. I'm aware that eight bar associations asked a previous um, panel, they wouldn't know about it, but um, Glasgow um, Miscarriage of Justice organisations said um, that they thought that was a real problem the duty solicitor scheme, and where eight have said they wouldn't take part, and that was as a result of the criminal legal aid not being sufficient? Yes, well, I can understand that. Um, legal aid rates, as I understand it, have, over the last 20 years, shown quite a significant real terms uh, reduction. Mm -hmm. And the rates that, as I understand it, are being paid to solicitors now are certainly not economic. I'm an enrolled solicitor. I'm not a practising solicitor, so I don't actually do court work. We work in conjunction with rather than in competition with solicitors, uh, where we get our casework to a point where it's ready to, to be heard before a court to be then liaise with the legal teams who do that. And in, in the context of that, we have a great deal of contact with solicitors and counsel in the criminal field, and they're all saying the same thing. We cannot afford to do the work. As a result, were it not for us, the work would not get done. Mm -hmm. We are an entirely pro bono service. I would prefer that we didn't have any casework to do. I would prefer that properly funded solicitors were able to take it from point A to point Z. Regrettably, that's not how it is just now. Okay. Is there anything further um, the panel would like to ask? We have no more questions. Can I thank you very much for an excellent session? And I will suspend now to allow the witnesses to leave.
Agenda item three is consideration of a proposal by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act in relation to two UK statutory instruments. The first is the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgments Hague Convention on Choice of Courts Agreements 2005 and the EU Exit Regulations 2018. And the second is the International Recovery of Maintenance Hague Convention on the International Recovery of Child Support and Other Forms of Family Maintenance 207 EU Exit Regulation 2018. I refer members to Paper 5, which is a private paper. Do members have any comments? We have submissions from the Law Society on both regulations and from Professor Janine Carruthers, all of whom seem to be content with the instruments. That would be my only comment, is that the submissions were, I found extremely useful. Okay. And persuasive. Okay, thank you. Is the committee content to recommend that the Scottish Parliament gives its consent to the UK Parliament to pass these two statutory instruments? Agreed. Thank you. That concludes the 25th meeting of 2018. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, 23rd of October, when we will continue our post-legislative scrutiny of the Police and Fire Reform Act and pre-budget scrutiny. I now close this meeting. <laughs>